We are live. This is Emil Fisher with another episode of the BCTL podcast. Uh, today with me, I have very special guest, Jake Shannon. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, Jake Shannon is a, a pivotal figure in the American catch wrestling community. And he's also very much a fitness guru who has uh, trained with and, and, and truly learned from the very best. How are you doing today, Jake? Hi, Mill. I'm doing awesome, dude. Thank you. How are you? You okay? Uh, you know, I'm slowly losing my mind here. Well, not so slowly, but what are you going to do? Yeah, it's it's a bit maddening. It's a bit maddening. I mean, I, I don't know, man. I don't want to get all political, but it's all bullshit. <laughs> I, can't, I mean, I've never seen a quarantine where they quarantine the people that are healthy, you know? Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough situation. I, I I understand a lot of what's going on. I don't understand a lot of what's going on, and it makes for some really frustrating BS. Um, I think that one thing we, we have mixed blessings right now, considering that we have social media. You know, I feel like social yeah. media has brought out the very worst in so many people on the internet because we got so many epidemiologists out there all so many facebook epidemiologists yeah <laughs> that's true i mean you know it's it's particularly challenging for me because you know i have a i have a math background uh, you know i worked as a statistician and stuff and so i mean i it's just the news in general is maddening to me to just see the total abuse of statistics and the lack of even understanding like you know kind of where the debate actually lies. It's not at these stupid talking head talking points. It's, you know, there's some interesting conversations to be had at kind of the methodological level of, of, you know, disseminating this, this data to everybody. But I, I mean, what can you do, dude? I mean, it doesn't matter. It's whether people are fucking right or wrong, you know, there's not much you can do about it. Really. I mean, people have, uh, People have just uh, become, you know, I'm, I'm like 47. So, you know, a lot of people, um, they're alive today, don't even understand a world without the internet, you know? And, yeah. and um, you know, it's weird because kind of, you know, when I was younger, they just pushed the shit through at you on TV. You know what I mean? You could unplug, like you were unplugged most of the time, like, you just read books or, you know, hung out or did shit. And now it's like relaxation is sitting there looking at a phone and even not relaxation, like every spare moment that you're not busy doing something else. And um, it's just interesting to see like how easily people are coordinated now, you know? Yeah. Like, well, I, never, I mean, this is a crazy thing. Like they turned off the fucking planet. I've never seen it. It's crazy. One thing that I find, like, so we can we can go around in circles all day about the specific methodologies and about how one one should or would deal with the situation. We both might be right or we both might be wrong or whatever. One thing that I think is super fucking fascinating is the mask to do. Oh, yeah. Well, there's all kinds of weird little subtle problems to it. Like, I see people riding their bikes and shit with masks on. I'm like, you're going to die, dude. You can't breathe in your own fucking uh, waste, dude. Like, you can't do that, especially when you're exercising, man. That's a bad idea. Right. Like, my policy has been, if I'm, go if I'm entering an enclosed space with other humans, whatever that enclosed space is, I put a cloth mask on because that way if I cough or if I spit when I speak or anything like that, I'm not putting anything out into the world. That's pretty much, that's it. Like it's just common that's sense. Reasonable. If I'm biking, if I'm fucking running with my wife or something, no, I'm not going to put a mask on because I'm 20 feet from anybody else. Yeah, it's reasonable. I think what they're finding is that, um, and you know, it, it, it's like you hear one thing and then five minutes later, they, the CDC says the opposite thing that they said 10 minutes ago. So it's very hard to, to get reliable data. But when you look at, um, you know, medical some of the articles being published and, and some of the research, the preliminary research being done, um, you know, they're saying that, that uh, 
it seems that a lot more people actually are asymptomatic carriers than uh, we really thought before. And that's why the, the mortality numbers went down so quickly, you know, because the denominator went, got bigger, you know, the number of people actually had it, but didn't die, but were asymptomatic. But the only time you're actually really contagious uh, is when, um, when you actually are showing symptoms. Yeah, but okay, uh, that's so here's, when you're, here's the thing with that, right? We're in allergy season. We're yeah, it's a bitch. Yeah, it's a bitch. <laughs> yeah, it's a real bitch, isn't it? <laughs> I, it's all fucking bullshit. It, it's all <laughs> fucking bullshit. We got Josh LaDuke watching. He says, only challenge matches in catch. Oh, look at that guy. Look at that guy. Hey, I like challenge matches. That's how, I mean, I never really, you know, when I came up and was young and before I got all fucking mangled up and retarded, um, it was hard to get a booking, man. Like there was, when I came in, when I first came in, it was like 94 and there was like no, you know, Naga and all that kind of shit. And then, you know, I moved into pro wrestling around 2000. And I think that's really when like Grappler's Quest and Naga and shit started taking off. So challenge matches were what I, that's how I thought the game was played. So I, I'm with Star-Lord on that. I think challenge matches are fucking awesome. Challenge matches are great just because you don't need a promotion. You don't need fucking anybody. You just need a gym. And now you just need a gym and a camera for YouTube and Facebook. That's great. I agree. I think that's that's really like, I mean, I, what I like about that is that's super grassroots. That's super grassroots. Like you don't get any third parties involved, just the two motherfuckers wrestling. That's, I like that. I like that a lot. Challenge matches. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Star-Lord. I mean, can we just can we just talk for a moment that, about how Star Lord does in fact look like a pre-diabetic best cuts model? I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, he's a he's a handsome devil, man. I tell you, he came out here to Colorado and uh, I, I took him to, to this fucking crazy ass lucha libre show, and, <laughs> uh, and it was awesome. I mean, it was like it was like nobody spoke English really, except like. <laughs> like his wife and his and uh, his brother who came and then me and my wife and my kids and like everybody else is speaking Spanish and they're doing like quinceañeras during halftime and shit. I mean, it was, it was legit, but uh, was it, it was cool. We, we, uh, I think we had a good time. Was this around the same time as, as uh, last, last year when I was out there too? Very close. Yeah. Very close. Yeah. That was, that was awesome too. I mean, listen, I know that you're, you're, pure grappling, which is great. I mean, that's really what I love too. But, you know, I think there's some serious business lessons to be learned from the sports entertainment world. And man, I think you're just rocking it, dude. Like that was, a, for people that don't know, you know, when you were out here at Denver, you, you uh, asked me to come out with you on your, uh, on your <laughs> fight to win deal. And dude, you are like a total pro wrestler at your heart, man. Cause you had, you had the fucking whole show going out. It was great. That was well, awesome. my, what's, funny is, what's funny is your entrance, that whole elaborate entrance was longer than your match. That's what I love. <laughs> yeah. I just, for me, it's all about having a good time. Everyone fucking takes this shit so seriously. Everyone thinks that their grappling <laughs> matches are fights. Yeah. We're aggressively yeah. snuggling each other right. on the match. I don't give a fuck. And I want my opponents to know that one way or another, I want my opponents to understand how little I actually care about that moment. <laughs> dude, that's so Zen, man. I love it. That's super. <laughs> it's fun, dude. It's fun. So um, your background as a catch wrestler, can we talk a little bit about that? How did you get involved in catch wrestling? You tied yourself Fairly early on to Billy Robinson. I mean, I was pretty lucky. So, yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I've always, I wrestle, I started wrestling when I was a little kid, when I was really like four, I, my mom put me in the peewees. And, um, and what's funny about that is that her father, my grandfather, 
uh, he's a farmer up in Nebraska. And uh, one of my only memories I can have with him that I have with him is that he had this fucking cane and he would make me watch AW Day, AWA wrestling when it came on, on the, his little black and white TV in the late seventies. And anytime I got bored and ran away, he grabbed me and hooked me with his cane and bring me back. The irony is that uh, AWA in the seventies was actually the promotion where Billy Robinson was big. Oh, no shit. So, yeah, so I probably actually saw him when I was like four. I didn't fucking know who he was, but just a weird uh, coincidence. So, um, yeah, I, I, I've always been involved in martial arts and wrestling and at some level. In high school, I got pretty sick with cancer, and that took me out uh, through, you know, I did nothing through um, uh, the end of sophomore year, junior year, and senior year. I was just jacked. It, I just, I was in a bad way. But um, when I left high school and started college, I kind of had a, a clean slate and I was really getting back in shape and I was, you know, wanting to get in, doing it again. And uh, the first year, the second UFC was in town. So I went to go see it with a roommate of mine who had gotten me into judo. Um, and, uh, and we were just blown away, you know, by like a little skinny hoist Gracie taking out all these tough dudes. So anyway, so I did, I did jujitsu and grappling from like that moment on, man, I was like fucking sold. It was like a religious experience for me. That's, I saw fucking Sean, your coach at that show. The, he was the first fucking MMA match I ever fucking saw it was that one. <laughs> That's crazy. He was, he was the fucking curtain jerker on that show. He was the opening fucking fight on that show. So he was the first one I ever saw. I mean, I didn't fucking put that together until like a couple years ago, but again, another weird uh, coincidence, but, um, so I kind of, you know, I, uh, there was not, there wasn't fucking anybody out here. We would fly in, um, Pedro Sauer, who was up in Salt Lake. We'd fly him into Boulder Karate, um, Ricardo Miguel or Caseca Munez, some of these really old school guys. And we'd fly him into Colorado and we'd do camps, like kind of like what I do now, um, ironically enough, but, uh, we'd fly him in, fly them in. And uh, eventually I graduated college. I was like, well, fuck it. There's no jiu-jitsu here. I'm like fucking addicted. There's like no grappling. And there was no wrestling at the University of Colorado where I went either. It's not a wrestling school. So um, I was out. I moved to San Francisco. I had a job opportunity up there. And, and Carly Gracie was in San Francisco. So I, I went there for a couple years. And um, it was a little challenging because I was a young man. I had an English degree, which didn't translate to a high paying job very well. And so, uh, living in San Francisco, uh, I was working like three minimum wage jobs. And even back then, Carly's place was like 200 bucks. So, um, I, I did it. I mean, I was very passionate and that's what I did. I did that, like, but it just got to be too hard. And Half opened a gym, um, down in the mission. And so I went and worked out there a little bit, but, um, Back then, there was no, like, the UFC was, like, it. And it this is, like, pre-Fertita. This is before it was a fucking sport. It was still crazy, like, tough man-style competition more than it is a, than it's presented today. And so um, I couldn't get booked for fuck. I was not connected. I didn't know anybody. I just didn't have that kind of luck. So I was like, I'm going to do fucking pro wrestling. <laughs> it's close enough, and this, these people will actually pay me. And so I started doing that. But then, you know, it was like, that's like being an actor. You know what I mean? And it's cool. But the problem was, is like, I go in and these guys are big and tough guys. I mean, they're, you know, they're durable people. But uh, they would begin to believe their own gimmick, like that they were, that they could actually fight. And I, I come from like taking challenge matches and doing all this stuff, you know, and I didn't have the look. I, I wasn't a big fucking, you know, bodybuilder looking guy. I've always been tall and lanky. So I didn't look like a pro wrestler, but I could kick everybody's ass in the gym, just not at the show. Cause that, you know, that doesn't make anybody any money. So, um, so anyway, um, I was doing pro wrestling and, and again, I had that kind of approach where I was like, you know, yeah, what is the fuck is going on here? You guys like, this is an act, this isn't real. And so everybody kept telling me about catch wrestling. Cause it was like the real version of pro wrestling because I kept fucking being annoying about it. And so um, as more and more, and I joined this uh, fraternal organization called the Cauliflower Alley Club. It's a big pro wrestling fraternal organization because there's not like a retirement 
plan or a union for pro wrestlers. So this is just a, a like a fraternal organization that takes care of old pro wrestlers, basically. But because of my involvement with them, and then my interest kind of that was this feedback I was getting about catch wrestling and that I should look into it. Um, and this is right around 2000. They started dropping these names like Luthez and uh, Carl Gotch and Billy Robinson, Danny Hodge, and these guys who could really fucking go. I mean, they were like legit badasses, geniuses, you know, savants really when it came to grappling. Um, but they, there was no UFC, so they had to do this shit to make money. Yeah. At that same fucking time, it's like when Sakuraba started going through the Gracies. And, you know, that was like mind blowing if you were really into the sport at the time when Sakuraba came because it was like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or nothing, dude. Like, yeah. no, I mean, nothing because they would just kill you because nobody knew the, the strategies they had really worked out, you know? And so when Sakuraba came through and he's a pro wrestler and then he was trained by Billy and I'm hearing this shit and I'm like, what? So, I mean, I'm just the kind of guy that goes right to the fucking source. I'm, you know, I, all they can do is tell me fucking no. <laughs> so I started seeking out these guys to learn. Cause I'm like, fuck, this is like right up my alley. I like want to know this shit. I love grappling. I'm kind of not that into pro wrestling, but I do it cause I can actually get some fucking money out of it. And there's these guys like Billy and Carl and fucking Vern Gagne and all these guys that were doing that. So anyway, long story short, um, I didn't meet Billy first. I met um, Carl Gotch first because um, he was in the United States at the time. Billy was still in Japan. I really didn't have any way of getting a hold of him. So in 2004, um, I had known a couple other catch guys, but they just they were just like regional, um, you know, pro wrestlers that happened to know a few of the hooks and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I knew Gene LaBelle uh, a little bit, not very well at that time. Um, but anyway, I ended up getting hooked up with Carl Gotch about 2004. And I, at that time I was like, well, fuck man, this guy is like the cream of the crop. He's the God of wrestling in Japan. Um, total fucking legend. I'm so lucky. I mean, I'd be stupid to squander this chance. So I opened my own catch club and I was like, Hey, you know, they call it like remote coaching or some shit. Now. I don't know when you, talk to your coach on fucking Skype or something and they live in a different city. What's it? Zoom class. Yeah. So, I mean, I was on the phone with Carl like fucking every day and he was really cool, man. I mean, he let me tape a bunch of it. He never did that for anybody. We just clicked. And so, um, it was awesome, dude. So I'm running my club with like, it's like, it's like Cyrano de Bergerac where the guy, you know, with the big fucking nose, is telling the other guy how to date this chick, right? Like Carl's telling me how to run a practice as best as he can. You know, he can't teach me technique or anything because it's over the right. phone, but he's like, do this, have you guys do that and, and tell and talking history and shit. Through Carl, I ended up connecting with uh, Fujiwara, who is um, just fucking brilliant, like fucking brilliant, like a great dude and tougher and shit. Um, I mean, legit like submission grapples, bears and shit like crazy, you know, like, um, he's, he's great, dude. He, and he's like, I mean, he's got so many colorful stories. Like yeah, I, <clears throat> his translator, some older white dude that came over with him when I brought him over from Japan, um, his translator is like, oh yeah. Um, people call him Kumicho and I'm like, oh, what's that? He's like, that means like Godfather. I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, as a sign of respect. So I'm like, okay, cool. And he's like, yeah, even the, the, the Kumicho of the Yakuza, the godfather of like the Japanese mafia even calls Fujiwara Kumicho. So I was like, whoa, shit. And then you find out he's like in all these action movies and stuff like that. He's a, he's a hell of a, uh, he's a hell of a guy. But, um, then, uh, actually Josh, I, I was starting to get known a little bit like I, uh, Kirik on MMA.tv on the underground gave me a, uh, MMA forum, the, the first catch wrestling forum. And he was like, Hey man, you should moderate it because you're really doing a good job in terms of, cause a lot of people would bullshit the history to put themselves over and stuff like that. And I was just pretty nerdy and straight about it, you know? And so, um, uh, we ran that forum for a while and then, um, like uh, Josh Barnett reached out to me 
and he wanted to do a, um, it, we'd been talking a little bit, but eventually he had said something like wanting to, to meet Carl because a, a Japanese fight magazine called Go had wanted to, to do an article on Josh meeting Carl. So I made, I helped that put that together. And, um, a couple years later, um, I was like, Hey, Josh, you're over in Japan all the time. I mean, you know, Billy Robinson, cause I want to, I want to bring him over. I want to meet him and I want to train with him and stuff. And yeah. he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll hook you up. So it was kind of like a nice little quid pro quo where, um, you know, I help hook up Josh with Carl and, uh, in, in kind, you know, uh, Josh introduced me to Billy and I brought him out and then we just really fucking clicked, dude. I mean, he, I was, you know, very, very interested in, in learning from him and just fucking humbled myself and shut the fuck up and just did whatever the hell he said <laughs> and listened and tried to fucking actually think, you know, during practice and stuff. And seven years later, you know, I, 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 I was his right hand man for like seven years. I wrote ghost wrote his autobiography and stuff. So, you know, I've had like a lot of awesome mentors and, and friends and, and, uh, big influences and stuff, but you know, really the, I've always been a bit of kind of a Ronin or whatever, like never really had a, a guru or a sensei or anything like that. Uh, but Billy is the only one I would really consider my coach. I mean, cause I, I spent seven years with the guy. I studied him like I studied math to get my master's degree. I mean, I was very, very, uh, motivated. And, um, so that's really, I mean, I, so my connection through catch comes as being a grappler that got burned out on grappling because I couldn't fucking get any success or get anywhere. Went into pro wrestling. The pro wrestler said, you're actually a grappler. Check these guys out. I checked them out, met them and studied with them. I mean, that's really the short, boring answer. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't short, it wasn't boring, but it was an answer. <laughs> so, here's a question. so I watched your, uh, your uh, talk with uh, Josh a while back, and um, I put some comments in there, and Josh didn't put them up on the screen because he's fat. Um, and I just, I, there was some stuff that I wanted to talk to you about that he didn't. So, you know, here's oh. an opportunity to kind of, you know, get some stuff out here. So first That's things nice. first, catch wrestling and the pin. Is the pin necessary for something to be catch wrestling? Well, I, I think what, what has helped me is to think of catch wrestling in, in two ways. I'm sure there's a million ways, but it's helped me to think of it in two ways. There's one where it's just a set of rules, right? It's just like saying like fighting UFC, fighting one, fighting pride, fighting Naga, right. fighting fight to right. win. It's yeah. like, it's a rule set. Okay. So there, that's one way to think about it. If but you think so about it in that way, what's that? But there's so many rule sets. Well, there's a lot of variation, but just like jujitsu, like there's, IBJJF rules, Eddie Bravo rules, yada, yada. It's just what happens when you have a, a bigger system or style or whatever, right? So there is a rule set. In every match that has been called catch as catch can in the past has included a pin provision to win. It's not the only way. It's actually in this way, catch wrestlers call catch wrestling when they say that, they mean pin or submit. When they say grappling, they mean no gi. Like, that's just where you could be on your back, you could do whatever the hell you want. That's just grappling. Like, if you ask, ask somebody like Gene LaBelle or something, that's what, what he would say. is If you're not being pinned, it's grappling. But if you're being pinned or submitted, it's catch wrestling. Just like if you're being punched or submitted, it's MMA. You know what I mean? There's two vectors there, right? There's two directions you can go. Yeah. You can punch somebody out or you can knock them out. I mean, then there's point systems and shit, but you get my sure. point. People generally don't fucking talk about point systems when it comes to like winning criteria, like jujitsu, it's submission or, or points now. I mean, unless you go to these submission only events, but anyway, so 
in that way, yes, I do think that technically it's not catch wrestling without a pin. It's never been called that historically ever. Now, that's only one way of thinking about it. I do believe that there is a canon of technique that is specific to catch wrestling. There are certain moves and certain strategies that are associated with catch wrestling because they were used in catch wrestling matches and documented for hundreds of years or whatever, right? And old black and white pictures and shit. So I think you could have a a, a styles versus styles match. You could have a jujitsu versus catch wrestler in a grappling match. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, he could win with a catch wrestling move. You know, something like a, like a, a splatel or something like that, you know, but then it gets murky because then you look at the twister and the twister is actually technically first a catch wrestling move, the wrestler's guillotine, but then it kind of was co-opted in language by having it be renamed and rebranded. And, and, you know, to his credit, Eddie Bravo created an entire system around that. Um, so, I mean, it gets a little murky, but I mean, if you pushed me on it, I would like if I was going to write something for history, if it didn't have the pin, I wouldn't call it catch wrestling. That's interesting. So my understanding of catch wrestling, and I also, you know, certainly am not the level of education that you have. I don't have the level of education that you have on this subject. I simply... I'm an enthusiast who has been learning it for a few years from Sean. That's about it. Who is the fucking man? Again, the first fucking guy I ever saw in MMA. I mean, fucking, <laughs> I'm such a, he's like my friend, but I'm like a fan. So I'm like, always having to like act cool and shit. I love, yeah, I love yeah. Sean. He's great. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny too. I remember when I first met him, I knew who he was. Just because I want UFC two, uh-huh. and I, and like so, my buddy's like, you got you got to go train with Sean, and I'm like, Sean, who's Sean? I didn't know who Sean was. Like Sean Doherty, he fought in UFC uh, UFC two, and I'm like, okay, so I, I look him up, and I watch the. I'm like, oh, I remember this this Vanilla Ice looking motherfucker. <laughs> I, why would I, like, why, you know, what, what does he have to offer me? Like, I, I it's real arrogance. Like, I just, I just assume, you know, what's, he's like, no, this guy's a leg lock wizard. So we go, so we, so we train with him, and he and I just hit it off, and we've been very good friends ever since. But his ethos, or his, not his ethos, his, uh, is like his, his methodology when he grapples is to always cause pain and to feed the reactions off the pain. Yes, 100. That is catch wrestling, but that's not the entirety of catch wrestling. That is certainly a strategy that I would say is definitely specific to catch wrestling, definitely not something really thought of in BJJ, except at maybe higher levels, like very high that. levels. Not even that. You know, like, so I, I 100% agree. There are certain strategies, just like there's a canon of technique, like, like I was saying, like like um, certain locks and holds that are specific to catch, there are also strategies. And and getting a guy off his reaction is huge. That is like a major kind of a principle of like just how to approach the game. I mean, I think the thing you have to think about is this. I think people get hung up on the pin uh, because it does add a whole fucking layer of complexity to an already – fucking 3d chess game, you know, where you're paying with physical fucking harm to your own body. It's like instant feedback chess and, um, adding an extra fucking difficulty level to it is a bitch. It's like, well, fuck, I'm already good at this fucking level of the game. I got to fucking worry about pins now, but here's the thing that I will say about that. Okay. It's not okay. I hate to break this to you, but it's not about you as the athlete. Right. It's about the fan coming and paying to watch something. And they don't come very they don't come like they do to big boxing events or MMA events like they do like you have to go specifically to a place like Iowa to have amateur wrestling be a draw anywhere. 
And a lot of that happens with BJJ. I mean, these shows, like you're on like the, probably the biggest stage. Uh, like the next level is up like, like Gordon Ryan and shit like that. Like you are on the fucking big grappling stage and sure. it doesn't, it doesn't draw like, like the UFC or the WWE or boxing. And that's because it's boring to most people that are just spectators and have never played the game. So adding a, a, a second dimension, like getting knocked out in MMA um, to, to submission grappling it makes it real simple for people to, to watch and get excited about. And there's a, you know, there's a lot more randomness thrown in that the actor, the athlete has to fucking deal with. And so um, catch wrestling is like that too, because now you can't fucking fight from your back. You can't, you got to fucking get off your fucking back while defending to get back into an offensive position. It's a difficult fucking game to play. However, you know, I think it's a, I think playing with the pin or practicing with the pin clearly has great applications for MMA say, I mean, that's why you see so many collegiate wrestlers just statistically dominating the sport. Yeah. And I think it's, they, they never knew a submission or punched once in their life but they knew how to put somebody on the ground. And, you know, in military parlance, when somebody's down underneath you, you have what's called the strategic high ground. You know, they can only move in two dimensions, but you can move in three, right? I can move, you know, on this plane, on this plane, but I can also stand up. You only can yep. move limited. And my mobility moving in every plane is better than yours. You know what I mean? Like by levels of magnitude, when I'm on top, I have way more mobility than the guy underneath. He's stuck in one position. You may be great at defense, but anyway, so I, I, you I, know what? I, I think I, well, let me just finish this one thought. Let me just summarize it. I think that the, uh, the real importance of the pin in submission grappling, which, you know, would be then catch wrestling is sustainability as a sport, as an actual draw to put asses in seats and pay the athletes and pay the promotion and pay the marketing, pay all that stuff. You know what I mean? Most semi, most grappling organizations are run are pay to play. You you pay fifty bucks and you go enter a tournament. Like that's not a pro athlete. You know what I mean? You met, you're a pro athlete when you get paid. Right. And, and anyway, so I think the real the, honestly, and this may sound crass to some people, but I think the real ultimate benefit, besides the strategic high ground, which I do think is a strategic benefit of practicing with a pin. But I think the real fucking benefit of this is that it's uh, it makes the sport marketable to spectators. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting that you say that the person on their back automatically has, it has the disadvantage in a fight or in a, uh, in a combat sport. One thing that I've, you know, it, it, that's just I'm my opinion. You are a badass from your oh, back. No, that, that, no, no, I I respect what I what I'm trying to say is that I'm just laying out an argument. Right. That I that, I want to present the counter argument. No, and and that's great. I'm not, I'm just saying that if I were to take 100 guys and and well, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I'm just trying to formulate my argument, but go ahead. Sorry. No, so hear, hear me out on this. The ground is the only – the ground in the cage is the only weapon in an MMA fight. Yeah, the only outside weapon but besides the two human bodies. Exactly. If you learn how to use those, you become very fucking annoying to deal with. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, it's true. For example, Anderson Silva – what he would do is he would occasionally place himself against the cage and then let his opponent swing and miss and hit the cage. Yeah. And, and so they hurt their hand. Was that? So they would end up hurting their hand. That's, that's at least that's what I, my understanding. That's why he would stand. I, I don't know if you, if you ever saw him like stand up against the cage and bob and weave and let, he let guys swing on him. Yeah. It's very, very clever. Very clever. Cause if, if they miss, it's going to hurt them. And they're using energy, and it looks funny. Now the ground, you can use it as a 
blunt object, essentially. You can use it as something to push off of. Right. You can use it as, as a way to gain leverage. A hundred percent agree. I would just say, so it's very interesting, the conversation that we're having, because this is kind of the yin and yang of grappling. Yeah. Because Maeda, the guy who went and taught his style of jiu-jitsu to the, the Brazilians, wrestled in catch wrestling matches and or right. in, in, in grappling matches against catch wrestlers. Mm -hmm. And so much of his style was how can I defend and attack while on the ground? Yeah. So it's almost like, I mean, I don't know, not to get too philosophical or whatever, but in this plane of existence, we're always going to have dualities. Like that's going to just shit there. It's just, everything splits into two. Right. And like we're talking, we're just talking a debate between top and bottom, but I'm not, it's like they coexist. What do you do if somebody is fucking always on the bottom? Not, you can't, if you have a fight, only one guy could be on bottom. Exactly. The other guy's got to be on top. So in the K in your case, let's say I'm wrestling a guy who is fucking like, no, I'm going to make the bottom my fucking domain. Like I'm right. going to be scary as fuck on the bottom. Well, then the guy on who wants to do that, but maybe you're better at him at being on bottom than him is like, well, I'm going to move to being on the top. And so like, cause what you're saying is, is bringing up many complimentary points to what you're saying, but from a top perspective. So think of it this way. You're talking about using the ground as something to push off of and, and something to help you gain strength. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, we do that, but you know, we do it from high amplitude, usually in the throw, right? So it's interesting because jujitsu is notorious for not really having a takedown game. You know, the Brazilian jujitsu, it doesn't have much of a takedown game. I mean, judo has a great takedown game. Sambo has a great talk, takedown, but they really just want to pull guard and get to the ground a lot of times. I mean, it's like almost a meme or a joke, right? It's like common knowledge. So, you know, in wrestling, we say we hit people with the earth. So it's very sure. similar. We're using the earth as well. It's just... Not only am I using the earth, but I'm also going to use gravity. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's not to say jujitsu guys aren't, un, aren't dangerous underneath. I mean, this is another thing. Like, I see people try to build this natural, like, cats and dogs relationship between, uh, between jujitsu and, and catch. And it makes sense, and it makes money, and so that's good. But, um, you know, I look at some, there's a lot of guys out there, just like your coach, that are hybrid guys that yeah. like Sean has, you know, he understands jujitsu very, very well. He has black belts and that kind of thing. Um, there are people that want to know all aspects of the game. So I understand what you're saying about the strength of being underneath. I, and, and I did that for many, many uh, years when I first started and was really only studying jujitsu. Um, I, I think I've become very convinced of, the ease of being on top if you just do a few things to adjust your game, you know, and part of that means practicing with a pin sometimes. Right. But, <laughs> Jake, Jake, here, here's, I guess my, my counter to that. Yes. Catch is catch can. What does that mean? Well, I'm trying to light this fucking thing. It ain't going. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I gotta get my new lighter out. Um, <sighs> So catch as catch can, yeah, it's like, it's a little bit contextual, right? Like, cause words change meaning through time. Sure. Um, sure. You know what I mean? Like what it meant to be a Democrat 50 years ago is different than what it means to be today. The words just change, right? Like, um, so back then, um, before, before, can, let's do this. There was one, there was once a time before there was a name catch as catch can. Right. And then somebody decided like, Hey, I'm looking at this fucking shit and I'm going to call it catch as catch can. In that time, that dude, it was illegal. Like fucking the law. Well, like how they are now with the gyms, they'll come and fucking, uh, the cops will come if you go wrestle right now, but it's, uh, it was illegal to, to wrestle on the ground. All wrestling had to be upright wrestling, at least in England at the time. Okay. And that's where the name was developed. So only these like, low and dirty people 
would get on the ground and, and fight like animals and dogs. It was, it was beneath, it was, you know, it was below being a human, uh, to some people, to the gentry and the fucking fancy rich Victorian snobs or whatever. So it was like a lot of times it was like the poor people, man, which was the Irish up there. Uh, the, the coal miners and the, the people I, and you know, the weavers, um, up in the North England. So there was what was called Lancashire up and down fighting. And it was just nasty as shit. It was like the stuff you saw in gangs in New York where they're ripping ear, ears and poking fucking eyes and biting. And they're doing submissions too, but I mean, I mean it's like, really the best way to do things, <laughs> yeah, level. It depends on your level of S and M, man. Cause that's some, it could get dark real quick. So that was called, <laughs> that was called Lancashire up and down fighting. And, and to even make it worse, the way they would start is they would lock up uh, like a collar, like they'd have to hold on to each other's jackets and they'd have these fucking spiked fucking shoes and they'd kick each other in the shins with them. They're like golf shoes. <laughs> and then they'd take it to the ground and stomp. I mean, it was gnarly, dude. That was the Lancashire up and down fighting. Well, that was illegal, although it was bet on just like dog fighting and other fucking shit was bet on back then. Um, and, and some of these guys, guys got good enough to be pros. They could live off the earnings they made from bets, which is, goes back to the challenge matches and back to star Lord. Yay. The, uh, the, uh, challenge matches is really how, how catch started. And so it was illegal to, 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 because it was such a revolutionary concept for people to actually continue the, the, the game on the ground. You couldn't grab below the waist. You couldn't grab the legs and take the guy down. You couldn't do an ankle pick or anything like that. They said, catch as catch can. Catch whatever you can to win. So there was no part of the body. There was no, you know, it's like fucking Donahue's rediscovering it. Like, why not use the other 50% of the body? Catch as catch can. There's no well, part of the body. On your back. Catch as catch can. <laughs> well, now here's the thing. Here's what you're going to love. And this is, this is your loophole, okay? We said, we said earlier that there was variances in the rule sets, right? Yeah. No, I, hear you. I hear you. So there was variances in the rule sets. These rule sets, some of them banned chokes. Some of them banned toe holds. Some of them banned uh, full Nelsons. Right. Um, some of the matches had um, five count pins. Some of them, the pin meant just the two shoulders. Some meant two shoulders and a hip had to be down. Right. Um, so I think your loophole is on the variance in the rules. And I am almost certain that there were uh, matches that were had that were straight grappling matches. I don't have any of them off the top of my head. Um, performed by catch wrestlers on catch wrestling shows or tournaments or whatever. What they would also do a lot of times is they would do um, three matches. They would do like the first one was catch as catch can, which the rule, because it was the rules. Cause a lot of this people only gave a fuck about this sport because of the betting, right? It was the betting. Like these guys would be working a coal mine and bored and they didn't have fucking Xbox or fucking cell phones or Tinder or porn or none of that shit. They had nothing, dude. And they were poor. They couldn't even fucking read. They were bored as fuck. So all they did is fight each other. You know what I mean? And then they started betting money and making money off of it. So right. that's just what people did back in the day when they were bored was they bet on fucking everything. It's just how it was. It's yeah. so hard for people to understand that today, I think. So anyway, I think that you could get away with, um, oh, so they would say like first match would be like catch with pins. And that was the rule set. So the rule set was because people were making bets and they didn't want any fucking non-clear uh, terms in the rules or anything like that. So catch is catch can. Second would be Greco-Roman. And the, they would, if they were fighting something like somebody like Maeda, they would have a jiu-jitsu match um, or a straight grappling match. So I think you can make that argument that you come from that lineage. Uh, but, I mean, it's mostly, you know, you came into the game, into grappling, the grappling game, when nobody really gives a shit about pins. And you've never fucking won anything for pinning anybody. You've won 
by submitting people and you you have a game that fucking submits people on on your back i mean and you're good at it so i mean but here's the thing if i if i can be on top i want to be on top like don't get me wrong i like the reason that i play good the way i do is just simply for the sake of efficiency like i i don't like being on my back if somebody wants to fucking pull guard on me i'll let them pull guard on me. You would so you would prefer to be on top. One hundred percent. Okay. Um, there's only one recent. Well, okay. So for example, if I'm going against somebody that's known for their guard, I might be hesitant to engage. Sure. Guard. Sure. That's just strategic. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, like for example, I had a match back in November, right after you and I saw each other, where the guy came down, he pulled guard. And I just laid down in front of him because I just I didn't want to play on his too. Well, you shouldn't, yeah, uh, definitely. But like, if somebody, if if I wind up overturning somebody and they stay there, they're in for a rough time. Yeah, so I mean, I wouldn't get too hung up on the pinning thing. You cut. You were taught. You if, here's a couple things. You were taught by Sean Doherty who was taught by Ken Shamrock, yeah. who learned it from Carl Gotch and Fujiwara and Suzuki and, and Funaki. And they're all yes. catch wrestlers. So there you have a lineage ar argument, okay? That doesn't mean you have to be into pinning, though. You could like to just the fucking techniques that are nasty and this the light locks. About, this isn't about me. This is, this is about the, the philosophy of the sport. I'm genuinely curious because I respect – you over just about anybody else that I know as far as your understanding and encyclopedia like knowledge of the rules and of the history of the sport. I'm a fucking huge nerd. I'm a huge no, nerd I, for this I, shit. That's the reason I want to talk to you. That's the reason this is something I want to talk to you about. So, I mean, here's the thing. I, I would... So, if you'll notice, I will, I will not call a catch wrestling match I won't call it a catch wrestling match unless there's a pin. Okay. Right. Now, you may have won with catch wrestling. Do you, does that, does that make it, do you understand? There's the one way, which is, it wasn't a catch wrestling match that you guys did. If there's no pin, it's just because that's the rules. I'm talking about the rules, but the canon of technique, you could win with catch wrestling. Like I think that Josh Barnett beat Dean Lister with catch wrestling. Sure. Sure. Do you, does it, I don't know if that, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> that doesn't mean it does. But okay, so let's say, for example, I have a catch wrestling match with somebody. Yeah. And as the match progresses, they fuck up as they're trying to turn me, and they wind up in a turn and they tap to it. Say that again. Okay, so. I hear my own echo, by the Yeah, it's it's. There's something happening, and like when you, when it comes out here and then goes back in my mic. Maybe let me move this mic behind. All right, does that improve it? Can you still hear me? I can hear you, but I'm hearing myself. Hearing yourself. You're still hearing yourself. Hold on. That's why I was trying to put those headphones on, but then when I put the headphones on, it fucks with that microphone. It's so weird. Let me just try it. We're getting experimental here, people. Can you hear me? Yes. Nope. Can't hear me. I can hear can you. you. Hear me? I can hear you. I can that hear you. That whole time, could you hear me? Yes. All right, hold on. I don't know if this is going to make it better or worse. There we go. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Is that better for you or no? It's is that perfect. better in terms of the feedback? Perfect. Okay, great. So, so anyways, um, okay, I can't, okay yeah, so, so, so I have a match coming up on one of Josh's cards. Okay, the match is against okay. a gentleman by the name of Karinga Conway. Uh, Karinga Conway is a big, strong, scary man and very likely will take me down, very likely will be on top of me. However, the rule yeah. set is such that he has to pin me for three seconds to win the match. That's very right. hard to do if, you, if you're not a good pinner. I don't know if he's a good pinner or not, but I'm pretty hard to pin. I did wrestle at one point, you know, 
I'm not easy to pin as much to con contrary to common belief. But anyways, the point is, what happens if I snag a triangle on him, triangle choke, I'm up on one shoulder so that my shoulders are not against the mat, I cinch the triangle up, and he taps. I want a cat wrestling match, right? Yes, yes, you did. If you're not being... Okay, so... Again, you have to remember that, like, when catch wrestling was first happening, jiu-jitsu really wasn't, like, a big deal here in the United States. Nobody really gave a shit. Only, like, it was very small because it was mostly in Japan. Right? Like, <laughs> I mean, it, compared, like, people give way more of a shit about jiu-jitsu than catch. I can tell you that. It's a bigger market. Um, but anyway, but that's that's now. And back then, it was, uh, it was big and jiu-jitsu was nothing. So, you know, you didn't have people having to solve that problem like referees having to solve that problem back then. Right. Do you know what I mean? And it was yeah. very rare. And so um, what, like, for example, like uh, Joel and I have come up with this. I've also had, you know, I, so I started these catch wrestling tournaments back in 2007. Um, they were like, nobody else was doing anything competitively with it. So I was like, Oh, Hey, Eric. Oh man. Eric's another one. Like Sean, dude, he's like a friend, but he's like, I'm like such a fan. I, you know, I, I, I had him, I had him on, uh, last week or not like, like a week and a half ago. One of my favorite episodes, such a fucking cool guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's amazing. Oh, I forgot to do the watch party thing, dude. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> I'm going to do that now. I'm listening. I, I can't remember what we were talking about. We were talking. Okay, so we we're talking about the triangle choke as used in a catch wrestling match. It's possible. Does that change? The oh course? yeah. So I mean, I think there should be a provision in the rules that says, look, if uh, if the bottom man is being offensive, and what everybody, especially the referee, can see is an offensive move, which would be a triangle. That is, you are on the offense. The guy is going to be on the defense. Then maybe you consider refer, you know, referee, and this being in the rule set, you don't start counting if the bottom man's actually on offense and the top man's on defense in that situation. You know, that's yeah. very. I would think that's a simple problem to solve simply by talking to the referee and being like, and having both athletes in the fucking room and their teams with the fucking referee, so it's clear. I mean, there's a woman that we know. Her name is Karen, Karen Jacob. <laughs> And I think she would disagree with you, but that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's a different conversation for a different day. Oh, well, listen, just, listen, there's one thing that's guaranteed, man, that, that, that Karen will disagree with, uh, will definitely disagree with me. Yeah. There definitely. You go. I, I, we do not agree. That is, <laughs> that is true. Karen's a very disagreeable woman, but regardless. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'm alone on that, I, but anyway, Jesus Christ. So, what do you think needs to happen for catch to become more popular right now in 2020 or not right now, but when things come back? Well, the one thing that, you know, I've been trying to add this experiment, you know, with kind of an entrepreneurial uh, mind to it. And um, I think that at this point, because I tried to do, like I was just saying, the King of Catch in 2007 was the first, you know, competitive catch wrestling tournaments uh, in like a hundred years or something. And, um, I've tried to do that for many years, but it just doesn't go. Um, I, you know, I try to do it grassroots. I don't have a ton of cash to throw into this, you know? So it's like, I try, I try to do everything. I'm like a bootstrap entrepreneur. Everything I do, you know, I came from very blue collar, not poor, but definitely not fucking middle-class even, uh, roots. And so, um, you know, with honestly, without um, a financial backer, I don't think it's going to really be more than what it is now in grassroots. I don't think it'll ever go away. You know, I look at like it's almost like an indigenous oral tradition or something, you know, passed down from people to people. I mean, there was no legit catch wrestling, um, no legit submission grappling, really, uh, in America until the, the UFC really got big, you know, and so. Catch wrestling stayed alive during all that dark kind of pro wrestling era when everybody was, you know, was fixed fights and works and shit. So for it to actually get big and people to be celebrities and, and, and frankly, 
we need to draw top talent. We've never really been able to do that. The closest we came was in that 2018 thing was, you know, Josh finally was sick of his disagreements with Karen. And, uh, and at one of, uh, one of my friend, jo- uh, Joe Baines, um, he came up with me and Billy. Um, we did a tournament out in New Jersey, but it was an invitational. We we're trying to take it to the next level. Uh, but we, that whole Genesis actually came because, Josh was like so fucking annoyed and said, fine, just show up at this fucking open tournament. And it's like, you know, we have like 40, 50, maybe 60 people come to these tournaments. They're not big. Um, yeah. But all of a sudden when Josh threw his name in, it was like, ah, shit, you know, we're getting like Japanese media and shit involved. And so we tried to do the best we could, but you know, I mean, Joel's like a retired air force guy and I'm like a stay home dad that, you know, does this wrestling thing and has a mom and pop business with his wife. I mean, so we're just trying to do the best we can because we're really like into it. But yeah, to take it to the next level, I think it's going to take money like investors. I mean, I'm, I am a pretty crazy entrepreneur. Like you mentioned, like I invented the Mace Bell, you know, I started scientific wrestling. I've um, launched a couple other companies in the financial field. Um, so I bought and sold businesses. And, you know, I understand this and I worked in investment banking. I worked in mortgage banking as a mathematician. Um, and I understand the business side of what it's actually going to take. And we need a fucking Fertitta or a uh, Tony Khan or Vince McMahon or, I mean, anybody to throw some money at us and let who has the same vision of fucking catch wrestling as catch wrestling. That's, have you ever I, that's what to, it's going to take. Have you ever talked to Seth Daniels? No, no, I haven't. Um, so uh, a friend of mine out here works uh, uh, for him. The the Night Pigeon is his wrestling name. Okay, I know the Night Pigeon, Troy. Yeah, so he... Um, <clears throat> I love Troy. He, his roommate is like way into catch and, and, you know, he lives out here in Colorado. He just opened a gym. Uh, I mean, right before all this fucking shit happened too. So, I mean, I definitely, I think it's called Nova Mente, but I could be getting that wrong, but just look up Troy. He's a fucking badass. Um, <clears throat> night pigeon, look him up on if you type in night pigeon. What's that? Yeah. Troy Everett. Troy Everett. Yeah. But if you type in night pigeon, it, it'll, his page will come up. I think I, that's, oh. <laughs> that's how I remember to get it. But, um, he, uh, he lives out here and I know his roommate is like totally like, we train all the time and stuff. He's a, he's really enthusiastic, uh, but he's a pro wrestler. So, and it's Troy's roommate. So um, I've gone to do actually when I, before, uh, you know, I went and filmed this um, catch grappling instructional for BJJ fanatics, right before all this shit happened, they flew me and uh, Sam Crescent out to, um, to Boston to film this. And uh, I actually went and practiced you know, because I wanted to make sure everything flowed and the presentation was smooth. And I went and practiced at Troy's new gym. It was like right before this fucking COVID shit happened. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, I would love to talk to somebody um, like Seth. I mean, because, you know, I, the way I look at it and what I've kind of actually started doing too, I mean, I'm really like trying everything I can. I've tried to go the straight grappling route, which I think is kind of what I'm calling now more the Brazilian business model. They've been fucking incredibly successful with it, but I don't think I've tried it. I've tried promoting catch that way. I don't think that's the way to go. And I think piggybacking on shows. Now I'm even getting crazy. Like I would love to piggyback on like to have an actual catch match with a pin and submit on a, on a, on one of Seth's shows. That would be fucking like, they got judo. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I think we're getting enough of a following, at least more so online. It's not, it won't draw locally, but it'll, I mean, when we put that show on in, in um, New Jersey, we had people fly in from fucking Japan to come see the fucking match. We only had like 200 people at the gate. Well, not even that probably 150 if we're lucky. And that was all friends and families of wrestlers, you know, um, yeah. it wasn't a big show. It was kind of a failure financially, but, um, um, you know, the fans are fucking hardcore and they're international. It's a, it's big in that way. It's not big locally. So you may not get a huge gate, uh, but you get uh, internet exposure for sure. Anyway, um, um, I'm even talking to pro wrestling promotions and being like, look, man, 
You fucking are going to do a hardcore match. You're going to do a table match. You're going to do a fucking bra and panty match or whatever weird matches you guys are going to do. Why don't you do a shoe match? Put a match on with real fucking wrestling and just make it part of the variety show. You don't have to make it take over the whole fucking thing because that shit sells. It's the number one. It's bigger than the fucking NFL. It's bigger than the NBA in terms of revenues. It sells. So don't change that. Just throw in some fucking real fights. You know, like problem with, I feel like the problem with that is that real fighting, as far as what we do, as far as just grappling, because I consider catch for grappling. I know that we use the term differently. You use grappling. Yeah, but grappling, a, a, a competitive match, a, a legit competitive match. Any sort of competitive grappling match with a pin, without a pin, whatever. Whatever, yeah. For layman is going to be boring, unfortunately. Yeah, but that's why the variety show format works. Like, I don't like tag ti- tag team wrestling, but I like watching them hit each other with a trash can. So I I kind of <laughs> look at my phone and don't really care when the fucking bra and panty match is on, but when the table ladders match, it, so it's different, you know? And that's how they appeal to such a broad base. They could bring in an entire, the pro wrestling market could bring in the UFC market. There is a an overlap of people who are into both. You can bring in even more people from the UFC by having realistic gra- competitive grappling matches. And again, you know, it's like, let's say there's a heavyweight title uh, contention and there's a cruiserweight and there's a tag team and there's a women's. You just make a shoot. There's a shoot belt. And people from this, the acting roster can come in there and try. <laughs> but, you know, other athletes can come in and, I mean, I think it would be a fucking brilliant thing to do. Yeah, but then, then, you'd be breaking, then you'd be breaking kayfabe. They already do, though. That I mean, since the 80s, McMahon's admitted the whole thing's fake. So just say, like, yeah, it's all fake, and there's nothing wrong with that. You guys like that shit. Bring in more people because there's a lot of people that like the real shit. You know, just yeah. bringing it, like, giving them a seat at the table is what I'm saying. But I think that that's the same approach that I would look at, like, an MMA promoter or somebody like Seth. Like, just give us a chance to add value to your show and, you know, entertainment value, something for the fans to talk about, and a, a whole, just a different vibe. The cool thing about Catch is it does – one thing that it does bring to the table that the other ones don't is it does have this deep, deep tradition of, like, not only history but, like, the evolution of different techniques. I mean, there's just so much for people to bullshit about it. You know what I mean? So I, I do think, like, entrepreneurially about – how can we make this an actual sustainable thing? And the only way you can make things sustainable is if people pay for it. Like I think the only, I think the only way for that to happen for you, unless you get some backers or yourself become independently wealthy, would be for these uh, grappling shows that are popping up like fucking weeds right now. I mean, you got Jits Kings, you got Kasai, yeah. you got Fight to Win. You got Josh's style of things. The uh, the, the basically it's, it's organized challenge matches. I just personally, I think that's the coolest fucking thing. Yeah, really. challenge matches are kind of cool. I I actually really do agree with Star Wars on that. Well, no, because like, are you you're familiar with Sapatero, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, all it is it's basically like a challenge style event. Where it's like at somebody's gym, it's recorded on somebody's cell phone. It's you know, fucking crazy. No, it's very twenty first century though. It's awesome. Yeah, you bring the competition with you instead of setting it up. Yeah, I mean it's pretty. It's I mean honestly, it's probably how things will be, all be done in the future at some level, especially if this shit doesn't change. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I I, I committed to doing. Uh, he's got an event coming up at the end of June. I committed to doing it, but we'll see whether or not shit goes to shit. Because I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not scared of coronavirus, but I sure as shit can't take, I can't afford to take time off of work if I get yeah. sick. Yeah, that's if get, true. If I get, I mean, like that, like that's the honest to God truth. It's like there's a finite possibility it'll kill me if I get it. I don't want my wife to get it, obviously. Like there's all that good shit. Like it, it is what it is, but. At the end of the day, if I get sick, I can't go to work. If I can't go to work, I got I, I it's my company. It's a tiny fucking company. No, I understand, man. Yeah. But anyways, but like the point is that um, you know, with these challenge matches, I do think it, there's a lot. It's the way of the future. 
Yeah, I think, well, it's convenient, too, because then people could shut the fuck up with all the fake beef off the Internet trying to build interest. You know, you could just get to it and and give people what they want. They want the fucking wrestling match. They don't want all the dumb drama. I mean, that's I think that's one thing where people get confused on the pro wrestling part of selling. That's not what they're selling. You know, what pro wrestling sells is the same thing that soap operas sell, and it's not really the drama. It's getting to watch, like, people in their fucking underpants be violent. You know what I mean? Like, it's just... It's just a lurid thing that will always be fascinating to human beings and people could profit off of it. Yeah, I guess. But I, I feel like, I mean, Gordon Ryan's a great example. Um, I mean, Gordon Ryan is a brilliant grappler. He's also got one of the biggest fan bases in grappling. And a big part of that is because he does a fantastic job of talking shit. He does, but he also has videos of him with his hot girlfriend in, in the guard and all that kind of stuff, too, in their underpants. Victor. Oh. <laughs> Either way, I think, you know, they're both, like, super fit people, and that shit fucking sells, man. At least that's what he tells people. He says that's his sister. Wow. Yeah. They definitely don't look – you know, maybe it's like uh, like one of those Pornhub videos. I, you know, I'm close with my sister, but, I mean, not that close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got no, you're, not, you're, you're not from the south i mean i think that might uh that might disqualify it neither neither is gordon ryan well maybe it's platonic man maybe it's just platonic maybe we're the sickos <laughs> I, no 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 she's definitely not <laughs> she's definitely not a sister and, <laughs> and they're definitely not platonic <laughs> but anyways so on to the next topic. I want to talk. I want to hear you talk about the mace bell. How did you come up with that idea? I know that it's the, the it's got its roots in Indian clubs and things like that. But tell me a little bit about how you built that product because I feel like it's such a fucking duh thing. Like it's such a thing that everybody <laughs> like you know like yes, you take a fucking rod, you put a <laughs> heavy ball at the end of it, and you swing it around, and that's a fantastic way to exercise. But nobody else. You know, you're the one that fucking came up with it. How? What? But, but I honestly believe, like, you know, I I do, I tend to, like, I'm a creative person. But I don't like to take credit for it. It just kind of just fucking happens to me. So it's like that dumb moment. Like, all of a sudden, like, two things happened at the same time. One, uh, I, okay, so go back to about 2004, 2005. I'm living on Venice Beach. I'm in between jobs, but I have these great jobs, like where I work. I used to work as a quant, and so I, you know, I had a great place right on the beach, very expensive, all this kind of stuff. But it's like these jobs are so few and far between. But you make a lot of money, so you can take time off in between. And anyway, I was like personal training and doing all this shit on the beach and strength training myself on the beach and kettlebells. Kettlebells were fucking everywhere, man. They were like. Oh my God, Pavel Tosseline or whatever, and Dragon Door, and they were just emailing everybody, and it was kettlebell this, kettlebell. It was like the fucking biggest thing in the world at that time. And I was into it too, so I'm like, cool, I'm swinging my kettlebells. Well, this was right around when I met uh, Carl, and uh, he, uh, I, when I visited him in, in uh, Florida, you know, Carl Gotch he was very famous for being like a fitness fucking freak, like super crazy fanatic, like a Jack Lane level of freak. Like he, um, not only being a pro wrestler and stuff, but you know, here he is like 265 and he could do like um, gymnastics on the iron cross, like dislocks with his arms and iron crosses. And he's huge, right? He's super nimble, super huge, just a, a physical savant. Um, and he was just into everything. He, he told me so many crazy fucking fitness ideas, like, because he was all crippled up at the end. He was like, I'm studying this guy, Maxic. I still get my works out. And all Maxic exercises are these old, like, exercises from, like, 100 years ago. And this famous guy, you know, like the Richard Simmons of his day, but they were tough back then. Like, <laughs> and it was like... It was like fucking isometric fucking exercises and Carl would do them like religiously every day, even though he's like totally fucking crippled up from having his hips replaced. Um, but I went out to work out with him and at the end of this just fucking brutal workout that he's like famous for, um, he's like, okay, now let me show you this shit. 
and he shows me the fucking things that the Iron Sheik used to have, right? And they're those, um, they're called Jories. They're the fucking Indian clubs. They're huge. They're like giant baseball bats. They weigh like 10 kilos each, like 22 pounds. And you, yeah. you, you do this like, this motion. And it's an exercise. It's really hard, right? Well, so I'm really into kettlebells. He shows me these Jories. And uh, at that time, this other guy named uh, Scott Sonnen had come out with these things called club bells, which were similar. They were just shorter and not quite as heavy uh, as these giant Indian uh, jories. Or in Persia, they're called meals, uh, like in Iran or whatever. Um, but they're ancient. They're like thousands of years old. Um, it's like there's debates like who did it first, you know, Persia or, or India. And different people say different things. But um, Carl loved this shit. And he did a lot of like these Hindu exercises and um the indian clubs were part of it and then there was this other thing that was called a gada g-a-d-a and it's that it's like what you said like fucking caveman level it's like a fucking long stick and a rock on the end and you swing it like you see people swing a mace belt today yeah. um so this was a a tool specifically used by the indian wrestlers um uh, because it helped develop your grip strength and some of your stabilizer muscles and your core, and it does a bunch of different things that you kind of have to feel it <laughs> to, to understand. Um, anyway, he let me try to swing his, and I fucking could not get the fucking thing going. You know, he had this 10 kilo mace, and it, but it was beautiful. It was made out of wood and like polished. It was so gorgeous. So I was like, what the fuck is that thing? And so then I had that moment like, you're talking about, I'm like, I went on the internet, the ancient fucking internet of 2005, and I'm looking for fucking this thing, and nobody's making one. I can't buy one. So oh. I'm like, well, fuck it, I'm going to make one. I want one that bad. And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I went and I called, like, a, I was living in L.A. at the time, and I called a couple woodworkers, and they wanted, like, 400 bucks. And I was like, well, I don't want it. $400 bad. So let me figure out how I can do this. And like I said, um, kettlebells were huge. The Scott Sonic guy had come up with an idea of doing these like lighter, smaller club things. And so I was like, let me fucking put something together. I'm going to put a present presentation together and I'm going to pitch the fucking leading manufacturer of kettlebells. I'm going to be like, dude, in the United States anyway. I'm going to be like, dude, all you have to do is instead of making that fucking stupid curved handle, just put a fucking broomstick in uh, of steel. It's like, and I'll get you the dimensions. I'll, you know. And so I asked Carl, I said, can you give me the measurements? And we went from there. And, uh, you know, what I did, I didn't know that it was called viral back then. But one of the very first things I did was on YouTube, you know, back then for kettlebell certifications and shit, people were charging like thousands of dollars just to get a certification for a kettlebell. I'm sure they still do, but like, it's crazy to me. So I was yeah. just like, I was just like, well, I'm interested in launching this thing into the market. It's definitely going to be riding the kettlebell wave. I'm just going to get the certification away for free. If people can film it on YouTube so I can see it, that they're not cheating, that they're actually doing the number of reps and stuff. And so uh, I did that and that kind of went viral, dude. Like everybody wanted to be certified as a Mace Bell Mall or, or whatever. And so back then, like 2006, YouTube was like nothing, but it just fucking blew up, dude. And it was like free advertising and, and it just really stuck, you know? Um, and then, and then I kind of, you know, I'm like only one guy and I got three kids and a wife and, you know, I got a life. Um, there's only so much I could do. And uh, I just kind of decided to really put my energy into scientific wrestling and trying to promote and educate and make a living at this catch wrestling thing. And I just couldn't do that and the mace. And so when I did that, um, it kind of got away from me and, you know, on it ended up making their own mace and they were way better funded and, I mean, I, you know, that was just, that viral campaign was a lot of, it was luck for me. Um, they're, they're better funded and have great marketing and, and, and they have great products too. Um, but they just killed it and they took it to like a whole new level and I wasn't even doing anything with it. And so now it's like fucking everywhere. I went into 24 hour fitness 
uh, like a year ago uh, to get my kids a membership. And I'm like, there's a fucking mace there. And I, I'm talking to the person signing me up. Like I invented that. And they look at me like, yeah, right. <laughs> it was awesome. I'm like, no, I really did. They're like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I, I feel like a lot of people don't realize. Oh, you got Sean talking about the shoulder hammer. Has he ever shown you the shoulder hammer? Yeah, dude. He said he sent me all those videos. It's great, dude. It's like a fucking, it's like a mega poi. It's like a poi of death. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, one of my uh, one of my good friends. Um, actually, is it, she professionally spins poi like for money? Like, because this was like oh, cool you know, with fire and shit. She lighted on fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, did you ever see my walkout at Fight to Win in Cleveland when I walked out the Terry Fold? No. Did you have somebody doing that? She did that. She did that. All right. Of the yeah, she led the way. Like I try to every time I do a walkout, I try to add new elements to it. Well, you need to introduce her to Sean, man. No, she knows Sean. They know each other well. Oh, okay. Well, because that that what he's got is like a mace spell, but it's it's like poi. I know. It's like I have fucking mega heavy. Yeah, yeah, I have them. It's oh, a nice. Fucking, yeah, he he, uh, he actually it was funny. He showed them to me, and I was like, "How much? How much?" <laughs> Uh, yeah. like, he just—he basically just charged me what 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 they cost him to make, but I was like, these things are fucking amazing. It's like a mashup between like a Bulgarian bag and a fucking mace belt. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant concept. Yeah, you can generate a lot of fucking centrifugal force. Yeah, we just have to get him uh, marketing it well. Oh, dude, he's in the same boat as me. Unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, he's not as entrepreneurially entrepreneurial as you. Well, I mean, I've like, it's just like anything. It's like wrestling or whatever. You only get good if you throw yourself into it and just fucking make a disaster of it for a while and then figure it out. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. That's just like anything. And so, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm entrepreneurial, but my problem is, is, um, sometimes I'm, you know, I'm a little, uh, I don't know. It depends on your perspective. I'd say principled. Some people would say stubborn. I just sometimes won't yield on certain things, you know, just for whatever reason, even if there's money involved. Like so, I mean, that I'm, I'm good at, we'll say that again. Like what? Like, what, like, give me an example. Uh, you know, I just, I'm not like, I don't know. I probably have some fucking self-hating part of me that like doesn't believe I deserve to be wealthy and worry free or something, but it's, I don't even know if it's that. I mean, you know, it's hard to self-analyze. I think it's more that I just, I feel more alive when I'm actually having to survive by my wits than, than when I'm just like a cubicle slave, like fucking cash in the check and blah, 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 blah. I just feel like my soul is dying and I've had really high paying jobs like that and I can't do it. I just, and you know, I've had some luck. I think, you know, I posted something, something on Instagram today by a thinker that I admire. His name's Nassim Tlaib. He's the guy who wrote uh, The Black Swan or uh, fooled by what randomness or anti-fragile. He's like a modern probability thinker guy or whatever. Anyway, he wrote, he said something. He said, look, mild success can be explained by skill and hard work. Wild success is just variance. And, you know, to me as a, as a person who thinks probabilistically, that makes a lot of sense. Because all he's saying is that you definitely should work hard because it will give you an advantage. But the difference between you and somebody else that works hard and, and they're super wildly successful and you're not, or you're super wildly successful and they're not, sometimes it's fucking luck. In fact, most of it is luck. So, I mean, I, could, I can't tell you. I've been, I've been in the grappling scene for so fucking long. And I've known so many really good fucking wrestlers and guys who I'm pretty confident could beat the guys who hold the belts and all this kind of stuff, but they just aren't connected. They just weren't, they just, they're just as good as those guys. They just aren't on the stage. You know what I'm saying? So I don't look down my nose at people who work hard and, and, you know, are successful or whatever, but I don't really look up to people that are like wildly successful because I just know a lot of it's luck. And so, you know, sometimes people who are wildly successful, it just kind of gets to their head and they're not kind to people 
And I just, you know, life's too fucking short. I mean, I learned when I almost died of cancer when I was 15, like, dude, I ain't going to fucking, I'm going to have a good time, you know, and I'm going to try to do what I want and not hurt anybody. So it's like, I don't know. I probably have some weird fucked up thing where I'm like, I just like making money and creating shit, but I don't like having too much money. I don't like feel I, it. Maybe I feel it corrupts me or something. I don't know. Well, I don't know what the fuck. This is like, you, I should be paying you for therapy right now, man. No, man. It's, it's, it's so funny. Cause like I've had these, these episodes and I, I just, I just asked the questions that, you know, like to come to me as, as people speak, like I just, I try to listen as much as I can. Different, different podcasters do things differently. My policy is I just want to shut the fuck up and listen to what you have to say. Well, you know, I, one, one of the things that I did, so I, I, I think what happens honestly is I get fucking bored. Cat wrestling is the only thing that really hasn't fucking bored me. Um, I, I do. It's like I get bored and, and, and then I just lose interest or maybe I'm just scatterbrained. I mean, maybe that's my way of saying I'm scatterbrained. I don't know, but I just get bored with a lot of shit and uh, catch has really kept me fucking interested. But one thing that I did um, about 10 years, years ago is I hosted a two way live talk radio station on a political talk radio station in Utah. <laughs> I did that for three fucking years and I'm not Mormon and I'm not Republican. And so like, dude, that was the craziest shit, but it's the essence of it is what you're saying exactly. And that is, if you're going to have a talk show, people are going to see you every fucking day because it's your show. And that's great. That's a great thing. But what's going to add flavor to you is who you interact with and their ideas. And so I think you're, you know, you're on the, on the good track as far as I can tell. I just, I've watched enough podcasts that I know what I don't like. And I'm just trying not to do that. And and I find that it's interesting because <laughs> like people, for whatever reason, open up on this, which is kind of cool. Tell yeah. you, man, I'm gonna have to fucking make you my <laughs> uh, my shrink. Yeah, I used to think I wanted to be a therapist. <laughs> so what um what do you think? is the next evolution in competitive grappling. Like as far as, you know, you, you see enough of the sport, you see enough of, um, of what goes on. You have an idea. Uh, I mean, you, the problem is, is I'm probably biased on that question. I mean, I'm just going to be real. It's very hard for me to be objective. I want to do, do what you think. I, I'm listening. Uh, just give me one second. My door just popped open because of the wind and uh, I'm still listening. But, but yeah, okay. But Okay, so I think the next evolution is going to be a merger between, and this doesn't mean an actual corporate merger, I just mean a conceptual merger, a continued conceptual merger between MMA and professional wrestling. So I think that eventually they will become merged and I am just way fucking too far ahead of the curve. Maybe honestly on this, because I see Conor McGregor acting like a pro wrestler to sell tickets, just like Muhammad Ali acted like a pro wrestler to sell tickets and just like pro wrestlers act like pro wrestlers to sell tickets. So, I mean, again, I could be seeing through rose colored glasses or in this instant, uh, catch as catch can colored glasses, but I do see a continued merger. Now, does that mean that it's going to be, um, uh, the rule sets will merge? That's my wish. Would I bet on it? No, I wouldn't bet on it. No, not real money. Um, but I do see, uh, the two kind of industries merging and possibly, there possibly could be like what I'm talking about where you have fake, you have exhibitions and competition all on the same show. I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting that you say that, but I, I just, I feel like <laughs> I'm just saying that cause that's where the money's at. Yeah. I in my, in my gut. I think that a lot of uh, pro wrestling fans 
I don't know. It's just it's a weird crossover. You don't see much crossover. You do, but you don't. You don't you don't see a lot of pro wrestling crossover into MMA, but you see right. a huge crossover the other way. But that's because sure. the money is the other way. Why the chicken cross the road to get paid? That like <laughs> Brock Brock Lesnar. He has fuck you money. He doesn't care what the fuck anybody thinks about pro wrestling or pins or he has fuck you money. Ronda Rousey, fucking growing chickens and shit. She has fuck you money. She's hanging out with Steve-O. She doesn't care. You know? And that's because of the crossover where to go and where the money's at. I see people, not just the athletes, but I see the executives on the competitive side seeing that. And that's why they're giving more time to guys like Conor McGregor, who act like pro, pro wrestling promo guys you know it's just it's just weird because the other fucking wrestler's not in on the fucking promo <laughs> it's like like connor's just improving his promos it's great yeah i mean connor honestly like a lot of people don't like connor mcgregor i think he's fucking amazing he's a great athlete and and he's a good business guy he under for like i wouldn't put him in a derivative tr training, uh, trading fucking floor or anything like that. He's not a business guy that way. He understands his business very well and how to make money with it. And, um, the only part I don't like is where, you know, and he's a young man. And so, and every person makes fucking mistakes in their life. And I'm not a big fucking wipe my finger at people. I think he made some mistakes. I think the fucking throwing the fucking thing at the bus and breaking the glass and all that dumb shit and the breaking the law. I, that's not necessary. In fact, I think that's like, I mean, that's like nineties gangster rap. I don't think that's necessary. We don't have to do that to set, to move units. You know, I think you could just do the clever promos and the, the head games and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, Connor has been incredible for the business people because people like him. He's very smart. I think that it, I think that it, to take it a step further, I think that what Connor does right. I mean, yeah, we. I'm not crazy about the throwing the shit at the bus and the, all that, you know. Yeah, of course. Obviously, that that was that didn't. I, I almost feel like that sort of wild card impulsiveness is part of why people want to watch him. You mean in the ring or out of the ring, or both? Both, man. He's a wild card. You never know what you're going to get. That's true. That's true. I mean... <clears throat> like, expect the unexpected with Conor McGregor. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, that worked really well for him. But then the problem is, is it's just like moves. If one person... If the champ keeps winning with a leg lock, then everybody's into leg locks. Or if he wins with an overhand right, everybody's all of a sudden into overhand rights. Conor McGregor made a shit ton of the money and he was the champ. You know what I mean? And so my problem is, is then everybody starts fucking with the shit talking and it's, they're not the, the difference between the shit talking on like WWE and the shit talking in the UFC is it gets really gross and crass and personal because the UFC is not scripted. <laughs> WWE's actually got writers like thinking two years of storyline down the way. And they're thinking like fucking dynasty and, and, uh, or, you know, whatever soap up or Riverdale or some shit. They're thinking more like that and how to make money with it. Whereas it just is gross and not good for the product, in my opinion. You know, it just, yeah, it just makes it look bad. Um, but he is definitely fucking special, man. I mean, he's smart as shit. I mean, he's a great athlete, but he's smart. Yeah, I, wouldn't, I, mean, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say smart like in an IQ test. I don't even know what he would do on that. Maybe he is, but business smart, man. Street smart. He's a really good hustler. I just I appreciate I appreciate the way that he paints pictures with his words. Yeah, the way that the way that man describes the way the man speaks, he does a very good job of playing the role. Yeah, he's he's a poet, dude. He's a poet. I'm trying to share your thing. I'm not being rude. I'm just like retarded oh, and I'm a little bit. That's okay. Here we go. So, okay. With catch wrestling, you know, with the Facebook groups and all that nonsense and all that 
stuff. Who do we have right now that's really repping cash? Yeah, we're in a hard, we're in a bit of a hard spot. I mean, I think uh, you know you you call him Karen, but I think Curran is trying to be that guy. I think he's trying, and I think he's a hell of a good athlete. I'm you know well, this is a match in like four years, dude. What's that? It's been taking a match in like four years. Okay, no, and that's true. These are criticisms that I don't. I'm not defending the guy. What I'm saying is that Curran is trying to be that person to rep it. Um. I, I do see what you're saying that he has not uh, defended. Um, he he's a young man too, and so I just don't think he cognitively is maybe understanding some things yet. But like, you know, I tried to make the match with him and Star Lord because that's I don't have a ton of money. I we did approach uh, Gordon Ryan or one of those guys. You'd have to ask Joel Bain. He's the one who did it. He wanted like seven grand. I don't have seven grand, especially after our last show did fucking a hundred people, 150 people at the gate. I just, I can't, I can't do that. I got three kids. I got responsibilities, man. I can't blow fucking seven grand on this thing that yes, would be fucking awesome. But no, I had Josh, but Josh got injured. He like fucked up his hamstring or some shit, like right before the fucking match. And he was the one who made the match. He wanted it to happen. So I think Kern is trying, but I think that, you know, I mean, he's getting older too. Like he's in his thirties and, you know, maybe he'll do like a Randy Couture or something and, and do something, which would be great. But um, I honestly don't see anybody uh, that's out there right now because I think that the last huge guy that was repping was Josh, you know, and the guy before that was Sakuraba and before that Suzuki or, you know, a lot of the Pancrase guys, uh, Frank Shamrock, maybe. Um, so, you know, the problem with catch is that for probably every one person that actually does catch, like when they go to the roll, they fucking put pins in it. For every one of those guys, there's probably 10,000 BJJ guys. Honestly, like it's that fucking huge. It's staggering of a number in my opinion. And uh, so it's just, you know, we do have guys again, like Josh or Sakuraba or Frank or any of these other guys who come up. And they kill it when they do, but we just don't have the numbers, uh, so it's rare. And so sometimes you have to go without. I mean, is Kern that guy? I mean, you're right. I, the one thing I see with the other guys is they just fucking fought all the goddamn time. That's how they built the rep, not, you know, on the keyboard, but like fucking just churning out fucking matches and putting their bodies online over and over and over again. And um, I don't see anybody doing that right now. Um, but I'm always looking, I'm always looking. There's a lot of young up and coming guys. The one thing I'll say is this, um, I'm noticing like the first generation of people interested in grappling these 20 year olds, um, that don't remember a time when catch wrestling, even though we're small, wasn't a part of the grappling scene. Like it catch wrestling. I created that in the grappling scene, uh, along with a couple other people. It really was not a fucking thing. And so I'm optimistic because I see a lot of these young guys coming up and they are fucking really sincere and very interested in it. So, you know, I'm guessing in the next probably two or three years, as long as we can keep the shows going and building momentum and stuff, we'll start seeing some fucking high caliber guys that can come out of catch wrestling and go to these other big, big shows and really uh, make a name for us. But, you know, I'm really trying to, instead of having catch wrestling guys go out onto other platforms. I really hope to build our own platform. I'd love to have something like a pancreas, but with pins in it, you know, that kind of promotion would be ideal. What do you think needs to happen? Do you think that there need to be like catch wrestling gyms or do you think that more gyms should have catch wrestling programs? Or what do you think you know, is going to take to make that happen? Like I, one thing I, I think so. I train at a gym called Strong Style MMA in Cleveland. Yep. Some of my training partners are elite wrestlers. Nice. Like elite. I mean, I, I've I've got I've had the pleasure of training with Andy Robat, who wrestled in the 2008 Olympics. Nice. Like elite wrestlers. Nice. Because we're we're a good MMA gym. 
Yeah. And so we're a very good MMA gym. We have the, the – And Ohio is a good wrestling state. Ohio is a good wrestling state too. Right. So the, the, I'm, I, I'm getting to a point. The point that I'm making is that, you know – you see this. You have the John Combs of the world out in your neck of the woods. Have you ever met John Combs? I haven't, no. He's one of the nicest humans on the planet, and he is a very, very good wrestler, and he's an elite, like, top 10, 170-pound grapplers in the world type of guy. Okay. Like, he's fucking good. He, was yeah. in, he won the ADCC trials in 2018. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Yeah, like... He's fucking good. I actually had him on the podcast a couple weeks ago. Super nice human. Awesome. And very good wrestler and uses his wrestling to win jiu-jitsu matches. Another another one is uh, William. Well, okay. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now you're bringing up something that I think is important to say. I would say I'll, I think I could defend this. Anybody who is a folk style wrestler is a catch wrestler. Mm -hmm. I would say that they may not even know it. They may not even know it, but just like judo is in the jujitsu family, they just changed the rules. They took out some of the rules. That's the only difference between catch wrestling and amateur. And in fact, freestyle used to be called in the 1904 fucking Olympics, amateur catches catch can. Yep. So the thing that you're wrestling, this Olympic wrestler, right? He was an am- it, the name, like we we're saying, how names change over time. Yep. It used to not be called freestyle. It used to be called amateur catches catch can. Freestyle, alluding to catches catch can. Grab any part of the body you can versus Greco Roman, which is stand up, right? Yeah, it's it's funny. Um, I think it was him that when I initially uh, I sent him a screenshot of my catches catch can match for Josh's promotion. His response yeah. was what is catches catch can. Yeah. Dude. No, what's really worse is uh, when Billy and I went over to England. Um, so in 2011, you know, Billy had really been wanting to get back to England. He hadn't been there in years. Um, I mean, we hear him talk and you hear his accent and all that kind of stuff. But when they, when the English hear him talk, they hear an American accent. Like that's how long Billy had been here. And so he was really wanting to get back. And so I'm like, fuck, how do we get out there um, and do a, like a, t- a seminar tour or whatever? And so that was our first one. And we booked it over there with the uh, help of my friend Andy Critton in, uh, in uh, Doncaster in the UK. We go out there and I'm fucking with Billy fucking Robinson. We fly into Manchester Airport where Billy was born and we're, it's like a half hour from fucking Wigan. We get in the car. It takes forever because Billy's like fucking crippled with a cane and shit. We get in the car, this cab, who's going to take us to the first gig. I think it was um, over by a, a guy named Chris Cross. I, I can't remember the uh, Stockport or Stockton. Or, anyway, we get in the car and the fucking cab driver is a martial artist. And he's like <laughs> really into Jeet Kune Do and he's telling us all about the fucking UFC and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, do you know who's in the fucking car? This is Billy Robinson. He's like, huh? And I'm like, you've never heard of catch wrestling? We were 30 miles from fucking Wigan. Yeah. It was so not only is like your folk style buddy never fucking heard of it, people I even fucking in England right there, the martial arts nerds never heard of it. I could be mistaken. It could have been somebody else that asked that. I'm fairly certain it was him. <laughs> but I mean, the point, like the I've the ever point is the same. The point is the same, is that nobody knows what the fuck it is still. <laughs> like, even yeah. the people doing it, that's, and that is really, or the people where it was born, that's the irony about catch. So, so, so here, so, so let me finish making the point I was making, because I want to hear your thoughts on this. So you've got these elite wrestlers, and there's a lot of them coming up right now in, at this moment in competitive grappling. You have the Tackett brothers in Texas, William and, Andrew Tackett, you have Cody Steele training with them. Because there's money in it. There ain't money in amateur wrestling. But yes, I agree. I Go ahead. But, but here's the thing. These people are using very much a catch style. Of <laughs> and they don't call it catch. They don't know catch. They don't call it catch. <laughs> but if you were to attract those specific people, that, that group of humans, 
and you were to give them an opportunity to use their wrestling to beat jujitsu guys in a different kind of format, they'd enjoy, they'd love the hell out of it. Yeah, that's, that is very true. I mean, you end up seeing these guys and once they learn jujitsu, they very much look like catch wrestlers because they've got mm -hmm. <laughs> submissions and the takedowns and the pins. And that really yeah. is kind of what catch is, right? Is like known as sure. having those three domains really dialed in well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all, that's all marketing, like trying to do outreach and reach those guys. I mean, I've been lucky at, you know, a certain level. I've had like uh, uh, Jeremy Hunt Loveless, who is, uh, oh, I can't remember what year. We're going back probably 10 years, but he was the freestyle senior uh in the seniors division, freestyle champion national had Brandon Ruiz who, you know, won gold in the Fila grappling games. And so we're trying to do what we can, but you know, I mean, it's just a challenge. We don't have any money. Like I'd love to be able to go recruit like a fucking promotion, like a football team recruits at colleges. I'd love to have that money to be like real pro wrestling, you know, like actual pro wrestling, like actual football. And then you have pro football and you have, collegiate and I'd love to be able to have a, a pro organization that paid millions of dollars to these athletes to pay to play for this promotion but I think that's all that's left it, I don't think it'll ever get big I mean I I'm an optimist guy and I'm fucking I've tried everything I can um I, maybe somebody else will crack the nut and that would be awesome because I love catch wrestling and if it's big that would be fucking great because I'd love to watch it but I don't think um I know at this point of the might being 20 years deep of fucking hustling and trying to figure it out. Um, I've had lots of success in other businesses in the 20 years I've been trying to crack this catch wrestling nut. And uh, um, I think this is a hard nut to crack unless you have a big fucking backer. I, that's just what I, 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 I'm really convinced of that. Like we need a money guy. We need a fucking Abu Dhabi chic. We need a fucking Fertito. We need a fucking Vince man, somebody with a bunch of money to say, here you go. Start promotion. Here's like half a million or a million bucks. Fucking. You guys so. take back on existing organizations. I mean, I, I know that there's so many organizations right now that are doing grappling as a sport and the catch rule set, like, you know, look at third coast, third coast just did those weird matches between Gordon Ryan and uh, yeah. That, and that's in the catch, re, that's totally in the vein of catch wrestling thinking where you have three matches with different rule sets. That's very much a catch wrestling kind of thing. Right. I mean, that, dude, I see tag team fucking jujitsu. Yeah. You're getting so that specifically for pro wrestling. You don't see that elsewhere. Yeah. It's merging. You know what I mean? That's, I think that's going to happen. What's interesting is that was initially done up in Canada. That, that style of competition was done by my buddy, uh, Derek Cat Clark. He, uh, he did it up in Canada. It's his submission series pro. Okay. In fact, I mean, he did, he, he kind of went, I don't know what he's up to these days, but yeah. So where in Canada is he? Cause you know, there's like the middle, the East coast, the West coast. Nova Scotia. Okay. So that's out on the uh, Atlantic ocean, right? Yeah. Kind of close to Montreal. I don't know. I'd say Montreal is a big city that's close to it. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, Canada is a huge pro wrestling country. Like they're like, there's like maybe four or five big pro wrestling company uh, countries like Canada, United States, Mexico, Japan, kind of think Puerto Rico. Um, I mean, it exists everywhere, but those are the big, big countries. So, I mean, I don't know. You know, maybe, I don't, do you know how he got the idea to do the tag team jujitsu? I actually don't. Um, it's interesting because he reached out to me back when I first started writing for Jiu-Jitsu Times to offer, to, to, to ask me to do some coverage for him. Um, because that's, that's usually how I do coverage for people. They reach out to me. They're like, I want you to cover my event. And I go, sure. And then he flew me up there for a tournament that he hosted up there. And the tournament wound up it was weird because like the tournament happened and then it was from there. Like, I, I think that he had a bunch of issues pop up shortly after that. Like his wife left him. He, oh. um, 
you know, one of the, the kids in the local MMA community committed suicide. Like it was just like a list of difficult situations for a human to have to deal with. Yeah. And like in the they, same time. Yeah. He, like this was over the course of about a year from what I understand. And like after that, like he did a couple more events and then he kind of dropped off the face of the earth. Uh, at least from what I've seen, maybe he's still around. I just don't know. But um, the reason I'm bringing him up is because it just, he was the first one that I saw do ca uh, tag team in jujitsu. I mean, again, I just, and I don't mean to bring it back or to, to use your point to make my point, but I guess I am. Uh, I just see them merging, man. I see them merging. I, I hey. mean, because ultimately the only way we get to see stuff like well-produced shit is if there's money involved. And the only way there's money involved if is it, if it makes more money than it costs, you know, if it's profitable and boy, that WWE shit's crazy fucking profitable. I think that's what everybody's tapping into and they're figuring out how to apply it in the competitive realm. And that's kind of the lesson that I've learned as well in my weird way, you know, like I'm, I really do consider what I do professional wrestling. I, when Sakuraba says pro wrestling is strong, I agree with him, but I don't mean the fucking sports entertainment shit on WWE. I mean actual professional wrestling done competitively for bets or to make money or like challenge matches. So, I mean, I think it's just natural. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know if they're going to end up having like, I don't think it's legal to have like hardcore matches or tab table matches or ladder matches or whatever in grappling. Uh, somebody will figure it out. I mean, you see weird shit coming out of Russia where they have like fucking like group, like a Royal Rumble combat, you know? So yeah. I just, I, I personally have always wanted to have somebody toss a chair onto a mat in the middle of a <laughs> I just think it'd be funny. Dude, you know how you're running like you got your gimmick with the unicorns and all the crazy stuff coming out. I mean, what if like what if one of your times or maybe you give this idea to one of your guys or something, but like have them come out like a pro wrestler. Like, you know how Sakuraba, his way of doing it was coming out in the, the Mexican wrestling mask. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like have them come out with like fucking chairs or like the fucking spikes. It's, it's, it's been done. It's all, I mean. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> like my my whole sh my whole shtick with the pool floats is kind of my thing now, and I'm just gonna keep adding new pool floats to it and adding more people to the fucking entourage. Dude, that was so fun, man. That was super fun. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, it's funny because like that specific one. So I had done an elaborate walkout in Cleveland with the, the fire, with the poi spinner. She wasn't spinning fire, she was spinning poi. And the, uh, you know, I had two guys wearing the unicorn helmets, which were much nicer than the one I gave, I had you wearing. Yeah, um, I, I think you got mine at like the dollar store or something, man. That was a rubber. Yeah, <laughs> yeah was... absolutely. Because I needed something that was foldable that I could just stick in my bag. Yeah, <laughs> it was <laughs> awesome though. The helmets are like, they're huge. Huge. It's like this big old fucking helmet. And what I did was I found the, the two largest people I could get my hands on for this. <laughs> like they dwarfed me. I'll send you some pictures after we're done with the call. But I got to show you the one. I did a couple of really elaborate ones. Like one where I had Sean dress up as a evil wizard. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> and shit like that. Like I just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's all about the absurdity of it. I love it. No, and you know, I think your approach is the healthiest approach and the approach that, you know, won't give you burnout. And that is, like you said, like you're kind of casual about it. You're like, I'm going to have fun. It doesn't have to be so fucking intense and negative. It could be intense and fun. You know, like I think that's great. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, it's a good time. And like that, the match in, in Denver, I, I was nervous because of the, uh, because the air up there. Yeah. Yeah, I was super nervous about that because um, I, I didn't want to burn out. So I, I, I kind of finished the match earlier than I, I, I wanted to. <laughs> it was awesome. I wanted to make it a thing. Like I wanted to like have some fun up there. And I did a little bit. And then I was like, no, no, I'm not taking risks. I'm just going to fucking gank this guy. <laughs> yeah. That was great, dude. I just I'll always remember that the fucking match was over like in a minute. But the walkout was like 10. 
That's so <laughs> awesome. Hey, at least you gave those people their fucking money. Their, their exactly. money's worth, you know? Exactly. You got it. You got it. So, so Jake, um, for anybody that's interested in learning cat wrestling that wants to try a more brutal style of grappling, what suggestions do you have for – like there's – you don't know how many people have like asked me, oh, so how do I do catch wrestling? What's the difference between catch and jujitsu? It's like the whole different fucking ethos. Like, yeah, it, 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 mentally, the way you approach it is hundred percent different. Yeah, it's so funny because like my 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 grandfather was a catch wrestler. Oh, nice. In Hungary. Oh, cool. Like, see now, wait a minute. Now, both Carl Gotch and Lou Fez. We're Hungarian. I thought that Carl Gotch was uh, German. No, no, he was Hungarian. Okay, he was Hungarian and uh, and Dutch. Okay, like, I think his mother was, his mother was Dutch and his father was Hungarian. Yeah, my my, my grandfather was 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 a, was a catch wrestler. Back at, like awesome. I bet they knew him. They probably knew each other actually. Maybe he was. I mean, he. I'm Jewish. I come from a Jewish family, so like during the 1930s. He kind of disappeared type of thing. Well, and here's another interesting thing. Carl, uh, he was a Jewish, but he ended up in um, a Nazi concentration camp, almost died. Okay. Yeah, be because um, so they, you know, they didn't, you know, obviously millions and millions of Jews died. But then, you know, Hitler was also rounding up gay people, but he was also rounding up people who were in like fraternal organizations like Freemasonry and shit. Mm -hmm. Well, and they were all in the camps, dude, because Hitler was like, no fucking secrets. Anyway, um, so uh, Carl's dad was a member of an atheist uh, fraternal organization. It's not the Freemasons. It's called the Order of the Buffalo. And they had to get a little, like, tattoo on their hand, three dots. And um, Carl got thrown into fucking concentration camp because his dad was a fucking uh, member of this That's order. True. Yeah, he knew. almost died. Yeah, he almost died. And then the guy who actually taught Carl a lot of the fitness stuff uh, was a Jewish catch wrestler. Uh, oh, fuck it. I just had his name. Um, it'll come to me. Uh, oh, fuck. It'll come to me. Um, anyway, give me like five minutes and it'll, it'll pop up in my head. <laughs> um, so I'm not kidding you. They might have actually known each other because like of circles and stuff. Yeah. So, I, I don't okay. Know. So anyway, I'm sorry. I keep interrupting. Your father, oh, your grandfather is a German, is a uh, Jewish cat wrestler, a Hungarian I, Jew cat wrestler. I'm just, I'm just the, the the whole point that I'm making is that you know I've been familiar with cat wrestling and the cat wrestling ethos, you know, my whole life. Uh, I, I didn't know about cat wrestling until I actually started doing jujitsu seriously in 2011, 2012. And my dad was like, oh, yeah, my, my dad used to do, uh, he called it pancreation. I'm like, hmm. your dad was pancreas. That's amazing, dude. I didn't know. Like, I didn't realize. I, I, I only learned about that in, my, like, in adulthood. But yeah, but I, there, there's definitely a genetic component to things. You know, I do think that, you know, it's like probably an inherited trait, dude. Sure, you know, sure, like, sure. And, and that guy's name was Benny Sherman. Benny but Sherman. Uh, oh. Benny Sherman. Uh, if you just think about it, I've tried to research him as much as I pot, but Carl talked about him all the time. Billy talked about him, but Billy was like 12 years younger. Billy and Benny or Carl and Benny were the same generation. Um, anyway. Uh, but yeah. So the point, the, the point, the point is that, um, you know, so like I've always kind of had the catch wrestling mindset in my training, which is oh yeah, yeah, the mindset. But it's, it's like mean. a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't learn it. A lot of people don't learn how to do that. Well, I think that's because um, you know, just not a lot of people are mean. <laughs> Seriously, I'm I'm not calling saying everybody's a pussy or anything. I'm just saying that like I'm a nice person. You know, but a lot of that is because I'm 47. My testosterone level has gone down a lot, you know, and yeah. people, I think today, and this is Billy used to complain about this all the time, um, that people are just softer today, man. Like you 
fucking just had a harder life 50, 75 years ago, man. You had to shit outside the cold winter. You know what I mean? In an outhouse. That wasn't that fucking long ago. We have it so easy and we've gotten soft. And so, you know, in that way, catch is at a bit of a disadvantage. But I'll say this, like, I think the ethos that we're talking about, I think it's very much alive in America's uh, wrestling rooms. Yeah, for sure. Mo- mo- most people can't fucking do a, a, a wrestling workout that you find at a high school or yeah. at a college, definitely. Uh, let alone what these Olympic guys fucking do. So that ethos of just fucking hard, 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 man, like going really grinding it out, uh, especially that kind of Iowa style approach. You know, but you look at like a guy that that I really admire and consider a mentor, um, uh, Wade Chalice, right? And um, here's a guy that he's the best wrestler that nobody's ever fucking heard of. And yet he's got the Guinness Book of World Records. He's got the record for the most wins in all wrestling, the most pins in all the rest in wrestling, the most wins over national champions, the most wins over international. I mean, this guy's like like an X-Man or a fucking superhero, you know, in wrestling. It's like unbelievable. He won the Tbilisi tournament, which is like the hardest tournament ever. Uh, he's a five-time All-American. Uh, he has he was an All-American in fucking, obviously, in folk style, then in freestyle, then in Greco, then in judo, and then in sambo. I mean, the guy is just like a savant, and nobody knows who he is, you know? He's like the best wrestler on the planet by some measures. So, um it's it's kind of a meanness like his first instructional tape which is one that we carry at scientificwrestling.com it's called legal pain and that speaks to the point you're saying about the ethos of catch that you learned from sean and that is fucking make this guy react to you if it's not against the rules then fucking do it. It's not against the rules to fucking cross face somebody. It's not against the rules to fucking put all your weight and fucking really, or, you know, try to make this guy put himself into a bad position. There's nothing in the rules that says you can't do that. There's certain things you can't do that are in the rules and you don't do that, but you take it to the fucking very edge and push it. (laughs) And that's very much the catch wrestling ethos, you know, not, I just don't, I think we're finding an uphill battle. I just, it's like, you know, why aren't there that many murderers? It's just not, there's just not that many people that are fucking into that. And I'm not saying catch wrestlers are murder. I'm just saying it's like, why aren't there, you know, it's just a mindset. And this, it, it's not rewarded really in this uh, day and age without something like catch wrestling. But I think MMA is the same. I think MMA is a really fucking brutal thing. I mean, I'll say this, like, you know, we were talking about Curran after we did, after we had that match and he went against some really tough guys. I mean, <clears throat> for all my issues with, uh, with how he behaves and, and stuff, um, he's a good athlete and he's fucking durable and tough, but man, he looked like he'd gotten a fight with a lawnmower and lost, um, after that match. It looked like, like, like a hazing, you know what I mean? Because his face was like just mad burn everywhere. It was awful. I'm surprised he didn't, get some awful infection or anything. And like, he disappeared for like a week after it, like Brandon Ruiz, I think broke his arm or came closer. So, I mean, it was brutal what they went through for that. And I just, it takes a certain level of sadomasochism that your general pot that, that's non-sexual, that it's all violence, that just your general population is not going to want to participate in judo, judo, jujitsu. These are more easy. You know what I mean? But that ethos is because these catch wrestlers, they're fucking dinner dependent on fucking, they were living on bets, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough because um, I think that a lot of people don't realize what it takes to really be a mean grappler. Hunger. It takes fucking hunger, like legit fucking hunger in your stomach. Like, you know, when people start thinking about being a cannibal. That's when you fucking like, that's where catch wrestling was born, you know, in fucking real bad poverty by very fucking poor people that were fucking hungry. And this was a chance for them to make some money. Yeah. That, that, that means you're willing to fucking kill somebody almost. You know what I mean? You just don't want to go to jail. For sure. I I just, I, I'm very, I'm always very curious about like what, what somebody would have to do to learn catch without 
an instructor. No, well, I think you, I mean, there are, you know, uh, the Evan Tanners of the world. Uh, by the way, UFC, put him in the fucking Hall of Fame with Frank Shamrock, please. Um, you know, Evan, I don't know if you know who Evan Tanner was, but he, um, yeah, I mean, he was all trained off of fucking tapes, dude. He didn't even like go to seminars and shit. Like he just was tape trained, uh, at the beginning and did quite well. So it's possible. Is it probable? No, there was one fucking Evan Tanner. (laughs) Nobody else, uh, really was able to do that. Um, so, you know, again, the, what we're doing now is what is the best we can do. And that is like, what I'm doing, like what Joel's doing, uh, uh, John Potenza, Jesse Merez, Sam Crescent, all these guys, we're just going out, trying to teach people, trying to host little mini tournaments and get people excited about this concept and think about it maybe in a different way and look at the history and look at the opportunities and stuff. Um, but the ideal way, to the way that I would like to have it done, again, why I keep bringing up investors, is I'd love to have a fucking stable. I'd love to have it just like Pancrase. You remember all the Pancrase fighters, right? They were like, it wasn't like UFC where they just would rotate in and out. You had Funaki, Suzuki. It was like pro wrestling. You had a stable of fucking wrestlers and you just worked them around. And sometimes you brought in foreigners and you did some different angles and stuff, but you had your own guys. And uh, if you have a tight group of guys like that, in my opinion, that's like a football team training together or a wrestling team training together, but they just have to fight each other, you know? Like Pancras. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, we are just about at the two-hour mark. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to touch on today or that you wanted to talk about? I did want to mention one thing, and you know, I saved it for the end, so if people were bored by me, then they already tuned out, and hopefully we got you the views you needed anyway. But, sure. uh, uh, you know, there's one thing. like um, la- So, like I said, I've been fucking – around the grappling scene and, and, and like passionate about it for a long fucking time. And, um, uh, I had to retire about 10 years ago. I, you know, I was, uh, in my late thirties and I was, uh, I had this great gym. I mentioned him earlier, a friend of mine, Brandon Ruiz, uh, fucking amazing athlete, Machado black belt. He's like, again, world champion at grappling, you know, the feel or UWW or whatever they're, they are. Um, brilliant guy, nicest guy had a gym with him and it, we just had this great fucking, I was like, it was heaven for me, you know? And, uh, I was training this one high school kid. He was actually the landlord let us use this gym if we would train his kid to win high school. And he ended up being really good for a high school up there in uh, bountiful Utah. Anyway, uh, I was wrestling him. His name is Jason. And my, I really noticed I'd had some other weird things happening, but I just blew him off. But my right arm stopped working, you know? And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> Doctors have been telling me for a number of years that I probably should quit because of some injuries that I had. But I was like, whatever. I kept wrestling for another probably 10 or 15 years after the doctors told me to quit. But my right arm stopped fucking working. And then I'm like, okay, I'm not going to wrestle this fucking guy who's a fucking animal high school wrestler one armed. I'm not going to actually legitimately be able to do anything. And I just, that's when I moved over to coaching full time. And it was like, I can't wrestle anymore. And about a year earlier, I had also been like um, having blindness. Like I thought they were migraines, but just everything would go white and I couldn't fucking see. And I would complain to my wife about that. I complain about my arm going out and I didn't know what the fuck it was. I, you know, I'd had some cervical damage. I thought maybe I had nerve problems or something. I don't know. So long story short, I move over to coaching. I put my intention, the same intention I put into grappling, I put into coaching. And so I build up this thing. I end up going to England after I had that trip with Billy in 2011. We keep going back every year. And even after Billy dies, they keep bringing me out back. And it's just fantastic. On the flight over this year in September, um, you know, it's a long flight. Sam Crescent and myself, we get off the plane in Manchester. We go to our uh, airport, uh, to our, I'm sorry, to our hotel, and I crash because I'm jet lagged. Well, I wake up and my fucking left arm is like swollen, like at least two times the size of my right arm, right? It's just fucking swollen. So much so 
one time when I was walking around just touristing in London while I was there, this is what I had like my fucking Peaky Blinders hat on. And I'm like, oh yeah, here, this hat. Right? I was walking around London with my Peaky Blinders hat on and my arms all like retarded and huge. And this fucking random stranger's like, oh, you're like the human Popeye. Cause you know, I'm like, <laughs> so, uh, um, but I didn't know. So this is the day we fucking land. I wake up the next day and my arm is like retarded huge, like from shoulder to wrist. And it didn't hurt. I lost no function, no pain, except for the stretching of the skin like a balloon. It was like those Indian burns, you know, it was like that stretching because it was getting so big. Anyway, yeah. come to find out I had a blood clot all the way from my shoulder to my wrist. I didn't know it. I thought it was just swelling, just an edema. And I was there to work. So I worked with a blood clot. Like it, the ultrasound woman who found this out later when I got back to the United States said um, it was the worst one she'd ever seen because <laughs> it was like the entire arm. Um, I should have died. I probably should be dead or I definitely should have fucking stroked out and, you know, be paralyzed or something awful because that's happening a lot to people. Long story short, while the chick is doing the ultrasound, I get back, I fly back, I do two fucking camps. That's three days, six hours a day of picking people up, twisting all that shit. I do some seminars and then I walk all around York. Uh, the city of York is a tourist, like seven miles. Walk all around London, like another 10 miles. Fly back home. It's still not going away. I get it. Fuck it. I, I go to the ER. They're like, it's a blood clot. They rush me in. The chick's ultrasounding me. She's like, holy shit, holy shit. And I'm like, your bedside manner sucks. And she's like, oh my God, oh my God. And she goes up and she goes into my fucking carotid and she freaks out. She's like, your carotid is fucking closed. You don't, you don't have a fucking carotid on your left side. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's good to know. So long story short, this is what I want people to know. What caused the arm? I My wife was the one who figured this out. The doctors actually... They ended up putting in the report what she said, what she figured out. Um, it was a combination of an international flight and creatine. I use I used to use creatine like all the time because of its ability for, at recovery. It makes you like if you're sore, man, you get recovered like quick. It causes clotting. That when they combine creatine with international flights, they're finding this is happening in pro athletes a lot. So any of you guys that are out there grappling and wrestling. Be very careful. Just Google creatine, blood clots, athletes. Like just Google those three words and just get educated about it. The second thing that I learned is that that carotid was not part of the blood clot. My carotid on the left side collapsed. The, the vascular surgeon seems to th or doctor seems to think it was uh, 10 years ago or more. Um, that what I was having with the blindness and the loss of feeling in my right hand, notice the Left carotid goes to the left brain. The left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. I, I had a mini stroke. So, and then I didn't know what the fuck caused it. I didn't know what it was, but there's a guy out there, uh, Chris Martin. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. And he's been doing a lot of research because he had the same thing. It's called a carotid artery dissection. Okay. And it's, it's from trauma to the carotid arteries. And I just want people to know. Don't do fucking creatine when you're doing an international flight. Do creatine. Make sure you hydrate and don't do it on international flights. And the second thing is um, we need to probably start be thinking about this and get ahead of all this carotid artery dissection shit because I, my gut instinct is that this is going to be to, what, to grappling what concussions and CTE is to like American football. Like, I think this is going to be a fucking problem. He's been gathering data. This Chris Martin guy, this Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt who had the same fucking thing happen. His stroke was much worse. Mine was like, I was lucky that I just lost the fucking vision and I lost my arm or whatever for a while and everything came back. But like, I mean, he had the full drooping face, sword speech, the whole thing. Um, he has a stint. He, he, they were able to reopen his carotid and he has a stint and he can still roll. But I've only got one. So uh, you you guys like treat chokes. This is my advice, okay? And I'm ahead of the curve on this, so please. Treat chokes like you treat leg locks. Just fucking tap. It's not worth fucking destroying your knee, right? You know what's going to fucking happen if you have half a fucking brain. 
don't fight it because you're gonna if you do that enough you're gonna fuck up your karate I, it's just anyway so sorry i just had to put that fucking do 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 psa you know now you know thing in there because i it's did important let, did you let a lot of people put you out oh dude when i started i didn't know what the fuck i was doing man yeah i am dude when when this shit started i mean yeah yeah see like you younger guys like you came up in like nice jiu-jitsu gyms and all this shit like in 94 95 96 97 man i started in 99. okay 99 fair but dude <laughs> there was no fucking mat rooms there's no i mean dude like i would have to go like anyway we didn't know what the fuck we were doing we didn't know we would like do things too hard ask sean you would fuck yourself up because you didn't know what the fuck you were doing and there wasn't really anybody ahead of you to warn you about like hey dude you know take it easy or you're just dumb and fucking full of testosterone and just you know like anyway so i do still think that this carotid artery dissection thing he there's only in the medical journals there's only one guy that um doctors have studied so far but there's one and there was that first guy who did the fucking who they studied for CTE and brain damage and shit from concussions. There was a first one. This Chris guy has found something like, and I don't, I can't get the exact number, but I mean, literally, he's found like somewhere between like seventy or hundreds of guys that have had this fucking problem happen, and nobody knew to talk about it. And I didn't fucking know for ten years, and I wouldn't have known hadn't I had a fucking blood clot. <laughs> And they had to scan my whole body for everything else. So that's just all I'm saying is that this is a legit fucking thing. You can Google it. There's a group on uh, Facebook. It's like, fuck, I can't remember. It's like carotid artery dissection BJJ group or something like that. Uh, his name is Chris Martin. You can look him up and he has like a, a symbol on his Facebook and it has like a black belt, but then it says like stroke survivor. So yeah. anyway. No, that's, that's a good PSA, man. Well, thanks again for coming on this. Uh, if people want to find you, let me know where, where, uh, where they can check you out. Probably, you know, like if, you, if you're interested in my work, uh, scientificwrestling.com is just kind of the culmination of everything I've done with Catch Wrestling. Um, but if you want to contact me or interact or ask questions, um, the best is probably Instagram. I just, I find it's the best platform for me to use. Uh, for marketing. Um, so that's probably the best place. It's just at and then scientific wrestling. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again for coming on. It was a real pleasure to chat with you. I hope to have you back on in a couple months, hopefully. You know, I'm trying to right now, I try to get new guests on every day, at least until the end of this, uh, this isolation period. But, uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah, I'm happy to be a regular at some point. If you know, if you got a, a gap and you need to have some crazy guy tell you some weird history and let some me tell you ideas, it was an honor. It was an honor to have you on. It's an honor to be your friend, man. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, likewise, man. I appreciate it, and you keep doing what you're doing, man. I just, I'm a huge fucking fan. It's amazing. Feelings mutual, brother. Have a great night. Anybody still tuned in? If you're interested, tomorrow evening, I've got uh, Justin Rader coming on. He's one of the best uh, American grapplers uh, in the game. He actually, uh, I think he was a Nogi World Champion. I know he won the ADCC Trials, plays at the ADCC. Super tough grappler. Um, then... Sunday, I don't have anything for Saturday just yet, but I will. Sunday, we've got some uh, musical talent coming on, you'll see. And Monday, I'm very excited to announce I've got Riley Stearns coming on. For anyone that doesn't know who Riley Stearns is, he is, he is the writer and director of the blockbuster hit, The Art of Self-Defense. I'm super excited to have that guy on. That's awesome. Have you seen that movie? No, I've seen it. It's like on Netflix though, right? Uh, it's on Hulu, I think. It's okay, with, yeah. So the, the, the plot of the movie is basically there's this guy uh, played by Michael Eisenberg who gets – or sorry, Jesse Eisenberg who gets yeah, assaulted. Yeah. 
he gets assaulted and decides- it's all awkward. And then he ends up getting that girl. That's like one of the teachers. I watched like 15 minutes and then I, I think I watched it late at night. I know it. Yeah. He's the writer or the director. Are you getting the writer and director? He wrote, he oh, wrote shit. Play and directed it. That's and awesome. He's a, he's a very, very good purple belt. Oh, cool. In Brazil, you can tell that you can tell that in his writing, he's not an idiot. You know, he's not an outsider. Yeah, he's a definitely not an outsider. He took he placed second in his age and weight at Nogi Worlds, um, 2018. I mean, he's wow. good. Like he's, he's a stud. Legit. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Anybody that's able to do that's impressive to me, and I, I'm I'm beyond excited to have him on. I got a bunch of other guests coming on. Um, I was super excited for this, and I wound up being everything I was hoping it would be. Thank you so much, Jay. Hey, thank you, sir. Keep it up. Awesome. Have a great night. Okay, you too, Emil.